On this episode, we discuss the final program. The first of many movies of the ECCU, Eternal Champion Cinematic Universe. Welcome to the Flophouse. I'm Dan McCoy. Oh, hey, I'm Stuart Wellington. Hey, I'm Elliot Kalen in a different garage this episode, but you're not here to talk about what garage I'm in. You're here no. because we've got a very, very special guest on this episode today. Uh, he's a television visionary. He's a puppetry wizard. He's a master designer of magic tricks. He's a heck of a nice guy. You may know him best from Mystery Science Theater 3000 or from any of a number of other things, Cinematic Titanic, uh, TV Wheel... Uh, Mystery Science Theater, other stuff. Anyway, he's <laughs> my former boss and yours, Joel Hodgson. Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Stuart. Hi, Dan. Hi, Elliot. Hi, thank Joel. you. I'm so happy to be on the podcast. Or I'm, I mean, the Flophouse podcast. That's right. <laughs> yep, thank you. you gotta <laughs> get the brand in. Yeah, I wanted to brand it right off the bat. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here. And yeah, Elliot and I worked together long and hard on the first 20 episodes of MST 3K that were on Netflix. And it was mm -hmm. a blast. And I'm so grateful for his help on it. He did an awesome job. Thank you. He was the head writer, man. And um, I couldn't have picked a better guy for the job. So thanks, man. Thank you. So do you think it was a, a, a bonus to his resume or uh, to have this podcast, this bad movie podcast on it? Or were you like, Ugh, this jerk trying to ride uh, the bad movie train, riding my coattails. I started this. It unfolded in front of me in a really unique way, and and I and I did think about it. It did pass. It did pass through my mind a little bit, but it's it's based on the way I felt about it is based on Elliot's character and my friendship with him, and I kind of went, yeah, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel discounted. I don't feel, uh, yeah, it doesn't feel slighted at all. I feel like it's some kind of embellishment in a, in a good way. So I didn't get that feeling. I saw it as a good thing. Oh, that's very sweet. I mean, this, no. this podcast, I'm sure, would not exist without the previous existence of Mystery Science Theater 2000, my favorite show ever. And I'll never forget the first time I met Joel, where we met at an, at an incognito diner in New Jersey, I believe. And it was like we were spies that were meeting up Wait, for the first on. time. Was the diner incognito? Yeah, the diner was <laughs> disguised as an auto repair shop. Uh -huh. It was wow. Edison, New Jersey, the Skylark Diner. And I've met, I've had some really important meetings there. I met Harold Buckholz, who was my, you know, executive producer for years on MST there. I met a lot of friends there and, and it's peculiar. And I don't know if it's convenient if you're in New York City, but it was convenient for me to come up to Edison. I live in Pennsylvania. So it was easy for me, but you had to take the train, and I'm sure there is a much more elegant way we could have met. I think I had to take a train to a bus and then walk for a while after that, but it was <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it because I was meeting one of my heroes, and it all lived up to my expectations. Uh, so Joel's here, and he does not have anyone with him that he brought, or does he? <laughs> yeah, I brought a guest too. I thought it'd be fun. I wanted to even the odds a little bit. You guys have all this culture. Mm -hmm. You have all this history, <laughs> yeah. and you guys like finish each other's sentences by this point. So, uh -huh. I wanted to bring the guy I work with day in and day out, and he's uh, a producer on MST3K, and his name is Matt McGinnis, and he's right behind this wall. <laughs> it's what? me. Oh. I'm here. <laughs> Boy, that wall moved really quickly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there must have been a monster at the end of the book. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. I like Joel. You said Joel. You said we finish each other's sentences, which is a polite way of saying that I interrupt the other two guys constantly. <laughs> uh, and so you guys are on here not just because uh, Joel, Matt, thanks for being with us. You're here not just to talk about this uh, very strange movie that we're going to talk about today, but also you are promoting something, which I feel like is kind of taking advantage of our friendship in a in a mercenary way, but okay, that's fine. Uh, what's going on with Mystery Science Theater 3000? 
Oh, uh, we're about to do another Kickstarter uh, for Mystery Science Theater, and it don't tell starts, anyone. It starts next <laughs> week. When does this show? I mean, they think we're doing this live, right? The people think that we're manufacturing this right in front of them. Yeah, which is pretty crazy considering people – we're recording it. People start, start it and stop it throughout the day because it's a long show, but they still think it's live. They think that when they pause oh, yeah. it it's that we're just for waiting. Them. They, <laughs> it's fine for them to control what we're doing, but if we uh -huh. try yeah. to, it's wrong. Once they press play, <laughs> yeah. we all have to run into a studio at the microphones and be ready for when they want to listen. Just like uh -huh. the people who live in your TV, yeah. Exactly. And this is – recorded and so our kickstarter is next week and we're it's pretty fun and it's i think it's <clears throat> make more mst3k.com and it's on kickstarter and we're making new shows and the really cool thing is we're going to have our own online theater called the gizmoplex which is kind of going to be a gathering place to watch show watch you know for premiere shows it's a premiere theater so we're going to fund new shows to make we'll premiere them in in the gizmoplex as well as um you can host watch parties there and watch old episodes and stuff like that too so it's it's going to be kind of i mean a little bit like because you guys are comedy nerds i can say this and feel comfortable it's a it's going to have a little bit more of a sctv vibe to it where the Mads are working to make new content that'll be in the Gizmoplex. So it's a little, that's a little bit, a, a little bit of a, a accent that's a little bit different, but that's a scuttlebutt. That's what we're going to be doing. And, uh, and so the Kickstarter campaign, so this is going to, this episode will be up on April 10th, I believe, right? That should be the day. So mm -hmm. the Kickstarter will be uh, going on, I think, or is it, a, will it just be about to yes. start? Yes. Okay, so maybe go, yes. So go there right now, maybe. <laughs> well, it's... this is the sort of definitive uh, promotion. Mm -hmm. that... Yes. Have well, I, I like... taken too long promoting my pitch? No, 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 not at all, not at all. No, What's this great is on... great. I'm, I'm Sa... just learning about it, so this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the first he's hearing yeah. about. I need to know what I'm going to be working on this year. So I oh, thank yeah, you, Matt. Joel. By the way, this is your job for the next couple of years, so it's good mm -hmm. that you're hearing about it now. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. This was great. Bye. <laughs> oh, dear. Now, Matt, uh, as uh, he's famous for his love of Disney and Disney properties, which will come in hugely helpful as we talk about the final program from 1974 or 1973, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. a, uh, a British science fiction fantasy film based on a novel by Michael Moorcock that I only realized while starting to watch the movie, I tried to read at one point and could not make my way through. And so it was, in a way, this... This was a movie that Dan was – we were watching this movie, and Dan was texting me as he watched it, talking about his – the difficulty he was having following the plot. And I want to say to him, dude, compared to the book, this is a connect-the-dots picture. Like, I get it now. <laughs> this was a movie that we were, were – was on a list to look at for MST, mm -hmm. and and Matt is the guy who does that. And so Matt, Matt kind of found this movie, and then he kind of said, well, you have to look at this movie – and then we started looking at it and we were kind of amazed by it. There's things we saw that we couldn't kind of get over uh, that were so in kind of incredible and weird. And then we said, oh, this is the perfect thing for the flop house. OK, great. And we didn't watch it until last night. <laughs> yeah. So what we oh, what we learned, though, is when we watched it all the way through was that when we initially watched it for MST, we had only watched the the good parts so uh, now we found out everything else yeah it was kind of like the ending which kind of blew our minds <laughs> and then there were just these and the other one was well i'll just wait on the other things that yeah, we yeah. got enthused sure. about yeah, but, I, but man we're really sorry this is a tough one but it was only 90 minutes so that's the thing yeah. we, we just finished watching Zack snyder's justice league so i was like this is trim this is bright this has a certain <laughs> jauntiness to it yeah it's brisk <laughs> Yeah, it's super brisk. I don't have to worry that Martian Manhunter is just going to show up, that any character might turn into Martian Manhunter at a given well, well, drop of a hat. Okay. We, we say it's brisk. It is uh, It is short and a lot of very 
unusual stuff happens in it that uh, you'll never see in another movie, and yet it still manages to have that sort of like 1970s British science fiction uh, lag. <laughs> that yeah. was, I feel like, <laughs> like it's got a nice vibe, you know, it's done by the guy who did a lot of the Avengers TV show and did uh, Abominable Dr. Fibes. It's got that like feeling to it, but also you're like, Oh man, how can something with so much weird stuff happening be so slow? <laughs> yeah, it certainly doesn't have 90 minutes worth of story for a 90 minute yeah. movie. So it's like 90 minutes, but it's got I mean, but this would be a great episode of Night Gallery. You got to admit. This yeah. <laughs> The thing that tricked me into it was was the art direction. It it really evoked uh it really evoked Zardoz to me. Like Yes, yeah. Like I love Zardoz and did you know about I mean, what is it, Borman? Was he the director, the guy who did Deliverance? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He finished with Deliverance, and he said, I got to do a movie where, where Sean Connery wears a red diaper. He had carte blanche. <laughs> John Borman, after Deliverance, it was the biggest movie in the world. He had carte blanche to make a movie, and he made Zardoz, because yeah. that was his pristine vision, and that was the movie that he couldn't. He felt like he had to make. And it, it it's kind of like, People are really critical of Zardoz and make fun of it, but there are some really elegant, as a production design, there's some amazing things going on. And when we saw, when Matt and I saw the good parts of this movie, I was feeling the <laughs> same way about this. Like, is this the same kind of thing? It's that kind of, it's the seventies. It's like the worst time in film history. And then they're trying to do fantasy science fiction and it's really hard. Yeah. Well, there was this feeling it feels like in 70s science fiction of like, well, no time is ever going to be as weird as right now. So if we're going to make a science fiction fantasy, let's just 70s it up as much as possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the more 70s it gets, like the more accurate it is to this time, the more it's going to be timelessly strange. So guys, let's talk about well, what happens in this movie. Oh wait, Dan, you, you say what you're going to say. Oh no, I just had that, that, that feeling too while watching it. I'm like, okay, well this is clearly satirizing something. But mm-hmm. I don't know what. <laughs> like, yeah, it's you're like, that... disco culture clearly is a metaphor for being inside a giant pinball machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a very sound idea, I think. And there's that kind of despair. And he's this unfeasibly smart, unfeasibly rich guy. And he, and he, there's more drug use than like uh, uh, the Umbrella Academy. Mm-hmm. in this movie mm-hmm. and alcohol all, all, from wall to wall drinking and taking pills right yeah it's one of the it's that yeah. time period in in 70s science fiction when you can tell who the hero is by who ingests the most chemicals yeah like that's yeah. how you know that they're okay uh so and it's so this is based on a michael moorcock novel now here's another mystery science theater connection he wrote the screenplay to it was i think journey to the center of the earth the version or it was either that or the land that time forgot one of the two movies that at we the did. earth's core you mean at the earth's core maybe it was at the earth's core and i remember very well Thank you for correcting that. Elliot, by the way. Yeah, thank you. I All remember the time. <laughs> I remember riffing that movie and seeing his name come up and being like, do we not do a joke about his name because he's going to be well-known to our fans, or do we not do a joke about his name because it's hard for me to think of a joke that is we can do on the show that's not about how his name is Moorcock? I don't know. I can't. <laughs> I'll let's just avoid one. it. Let's just avoid it altogether. Yeah, what is yours? No, thanks. I'm full. Oh, that's uh, good. That is good. Uh, there you go. Yeah. That's very good. Where were you when we were riffing that episode, Matt? You could do a bumper sticker, right? Make mine more cop. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so this is, uh, according to Wikipedia, it's the only one of his novels to have reached the screen. And once you've seen the movie, you're like, okay. Well, and it's part of, (laughs) this is part of his uh, Jerry Cornelius series. Jerry Cornelius is his version of like a mod, like super science fiction super spy who is a cynic and who's done with the world. And he dresses like a vampire. He dresses yeah. well, well he, with 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 dark painted nails because again mm-hmm. it's the seventies and he's super cool. Yeah, and he's like there's a little bit of androgyny there. Clearly, an inspiration for like Noel Fielding and Jermaine Clement and mm-hmm. like the Casanova <laughs> comic book. Yeah, uh, that, so very much so. So he looks uh, a little. He's got elements of Sigourney Weaver in his face too. The actor, like uh, Oliver. So it's John Finch who was the star of Frenzy. He looks he looks very Oliver Reedy. Yeah. Oh my he's, god, he, he was the guy from Frenzy. Him. Yeah, this is the guy who they who they think is the killer in Frenzy and has to has to prove his innocence. Oh, There's wow. a bunch of actors in this. Watching this movie, it was like, I recognize that guy, I recognize that guy. There's a lot of British actors in this that we will I will point out their their other roles. Uh and this is part of the this character is part <laughs> of great. Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion series, and we don't need to talk about that. So the movie begins <laughs> <laughs> because I cannot spend another minute of my life talking about Elric of Melnibene. I'm sorry, uh-huh. I can't. 
Uh, so that we begin with a jaunty band music. There's what a about Hawkmoon? Can you talk about Hawkmoon? Hawkmoon apparently was originally supposed to do the soundtrack for this movie because they're uh, good Hawk, friends. Hawk like, Wind. Oh, Hawk Wind. Band. I'm sorry. Hawk Wind. Yeah. And, That's uh, what I thought and, you meant. And the director said, I don't like them. And so they didn't do it. Uh, so Hawkmoon. Could have saved this yeah. movie. Could have saved yeah. this movie. Yeah. So to jaunty band music, there's a lot of marching band music. There's some people building a funeral pyre in a rocky wasteland that we will learn is Lapland. Uh, and there's this mod cool dude, Jerry Cornelius, who, again, is kind of like uh, if you crossed um, like – Mick Jagger and Patrick McGowan and the Prisoner, and then threw a little mm. bit of Robert Smith in there too. Uh, Oliver Reed, he's mm. got an Oliver Reed vibe too. Yeah, he's yeah. very Oliver young Reed. Oliver Reed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as in the the young Oliver Reed Chronicles, the TV show that used to be on. <laughs> oh man, well that's where they practice <laughs> you... all their CGI that they use later on. Yeah, the, the they prequels. used in the prequels. Yeah, uh, and you learn where all the elements of Oliver Reed's personality come. <laughs> yeah, like the building blocks. <laughs> Uh, so, and he's wearing this ruffled shirt and this big fur coat. Anyway, while he's watching this funeral pyre in Lapland, he, we have flashbacks to him talking to his old professor, uh, Professor Hira, who is played by – who is an Indian character but is played by Hugh Griffith, Academy Award winner for Ben-Hur for Best Supporting Actor. Uh, he's, he's one of these British actors who did a lot of brown face roles. Uh, and they're talking about the Kali Yuga, the worst of the, uh, of the eras in human development. It's a dark age of humanity that they're living in right now, which is coming to an end soon, which means the end of the world is coming. And this is the kind of thing where, as in many – 50s through 70s science fiction, people just know is happening through logical deduction. It's not like they point to like experiments or evidence that the end of the world mm. is coming. They're just like, we know it. Like yeah. we can feel it. We figured it out. Well, I have this... to say, before before we continue, I'm really happy that you're doing such a detailed synopsis because like I was not paying that close attention. So I didn't really follow. Midway <laughs> <laughs> through this, we kept going. I, I can't remember why we are, are supposed to care about this. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Even I had it many times during the movie, even <laughs> while paying attention. Uh, anyway, so we find that this funeral is for Jerry Cornelius's father. Uh, he was a famous scientist. Jerry Cornelius, it's just tossed off on the radio. It's mentioned as a Nobel Prize winning scientist, which is insane <laughs> since he's not only just a young man, but a young man who lives entirely on alcohol and chocolate biscuits. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah, he, he loves Girl Scout I... cookies. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. My window into this movie eventually was like, oh, okay, this is like British 70s Buckaroo Banzai. Yes, You know, yeah. like, this is like the idea, like... Yeah. That's a great analogy yeah, to it's, it. It's Barrister Banzai is yeah. what you would call it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's kind of like Bruce Wayne, but without any of the creativity or morose. Uh, well, let's, hold on, let's, uh, again, having just watched Zack Snyder's Justice League, let's talk about the creativity of Bruce Wayne, which is, he had one idea, I'm a bat, and everything just kind of flows from that, you know? Yeah, but this guy didn't have that idea, so. Yeah, he didn't even have the idea of being a yeah. bat, that's true. Plus his name uh, is Jerry Cornelius, which is a shame. Yeah. That's, Do you guys remember when he had to train, when, when Batman had to train to fight Superman? That was pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, you guys, this isn't going to be easy, but I'm going to start pushing tires over. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna, Superman. I'm going to start following a lot of weightlifting accounts on Insta. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be so funny if it's like he's got to start. He's, he knows he's going to fight Superman, so Alfred just becomes Burgess Meredith from Rocky, and Bruce Wayne's chasing chickens and running after a, a bicycle, <laughs> yeah. and then and. And then Superman just hits him in the head once and kills him. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that was, we, we went about this the wrong way. Okay, so uh, Jerry Cornelius uh, – also, the th I remember reading a Jerry Cornelius book, and it took me a long time to get over that his name is Jerry Cornelius, which I assumed was like a podiatrist somewhere, like in Great Neck. It, was like, it, was, it doesn't sound like a super spy to me. But anyway, no. uh, a colleague of his father's, Dr. Smiles, is there. This is played by Graham Crowden, who almost was Doctor Who. But he turned the role down, and instead it went to oh. Tom Baker. So imagine this guy with a really long scarf. That could have been him. God. Oh, wow. But, and he's I mean, we tall, were, we, so it would have been a super long scarf, right? <laughs> it would have been incredibly long. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, by the way, when we were watching this, Audrey, like who has never seen any Doctor Who, just just said, oh, I see why people like Doctor Who now. I'm like, <laughs> because <laughs> because they ha this was their only other option? I don't understand. And she's like, no, no, no. Just like She just assumed that this was like the kind of vibe. And I'm like, you know what? You're not wrong. You know, so. Yeah. Anyway, he was also in uh, like uh, in Oh Lucky Man. He's in a lot. This guy you'll you'll recognize his face if you've seen other British movies from this time. Anyway, he's like he's Doctor Smiles. He's like your father had some valuable microfilm. I need you to find it. It's in your house. And he goes, Well, I'm blowing up my house. And then gets into a helicopter and flies <laughs> away. <laughs> uh, Jerry, yeah, we, we, it up. 
we catch up to him drinking and driving on his way home, and the radio says his dad was a biophysicist and he's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he sets off a flare in the woods, which is the signal for his butler to come get him in a, in a boat and just meet with him. And the butler says Jerry's sister, Christina, has fallen under the sway of their evil brother, Frank, who's keeping Christina drugged, and she's been sleeping for seven weeks. And Jerry says to him, you've got to get Christina out of the house. I'm going to blow up the house with Frank in it because nobody likes Frank. Uh, Frank is a real <laughs> ne'er-do-well. This is a family with a lot of issues. Is everybody uh, following? this so far Mm -hmm. so this is when the movie takes its first what this is when i think it takes its real first inexplicable turn which is when he goes to visit general wrongway Lindbergh, played by sterling hayden who's a kind of like hippie general and he wants to buy massive amounts of napalm from him and we kind of are revealed to us through dialogue that some horrifying third world war is going on just off camera and the vatican has been destroyed and all these parts of the world no longer exist amsterdam is 23 miles of white ash that yes. is part of the dialogue there, yeah. And uh, and Lindbergh seems to he's he, I mean he's uh, it's Sterling Hayden smoking a cigar and you got to know that it was one day and he probably ad libbed most of his lines. That's what I'm guessing. Because yeah. he, he... well, and this is where in the movie I'm like, oh, okay, we've got like we've got ourselves a Southland Tales situation. <laughs> yeah. Like this guy has no interest in like telling us what's going on. He just thinks it's really deep if we throw a lot of stuff at the wall. Yeah. And uh, uh, um, Jer- but is this after? What do you feel? This could have been after uh, Strange Love. This must have happened. Oh, after very much. Strange yeah. This Love. is this is about. Yeah. So this movie comes out about nine years after Strange Love. This is during the time. I wonder if this was during the time when Sterling Hayden. No, it was earlier. I think when he was in Europe on his like self-imposed exile. When he felt guilty about what he had done during the blacklisting. I think that was earlier. But yeah, this is – it's very much – I think they were feeling like, well, this could feel like strange love if we bring Sterling Hayden into it. And yeah, we're going to have him play a general. Mm-hmm. But instead of playing a general who is crazy in an uptight way, we're having a general who is a little wacko in a groovy uh-huh. way. Like he's, yeah. he's got like a like a long goatee, right? Like I'm trying to uh-huh. remember what he looks yeah, like. Yeah, really long yeah. hair, like a huge long hair wig on. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he's – And, and a there's ponytail. pieces – it's almost like they 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 also borrowed elements from two thousand one occasionally throughout this too. Oh, so very much so. There's a couple of pulls off that, you know. And, and uh, it wants to be yeah, it wants to be very Kubricky. And uh, yeah, you were watching. You're like, oh man, this like this makes me think that maybe war is crazy. If this <laughs> yeah, maybe wacky war's, general's in charge. Maybe war's yeah. not so sane. Hey, you know what? What's so civil about war anyway? Yeah, it's I, a real like catch-22. Yeah. I'd like to see our schools get all the money and an Air Force hold a bake sale to buy a fighter jet. Uh, and Sterling Hayden's character is like, he should be in Skidoo, <laughs> but in somehow he escaped Skidoo and he ended up in this movie. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and you can do everything with a phone back then. You don't have to show anything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's a yeah. guy with a phone barking orders and like telling you everything, right? Mm-hmm. So and there's a war. Yeah. You're, we're not going to show you a monitor with anything on it. And Jared yeah. Penelis has gone yeah. to him to buy napalm and a computer-controlled car. None of this ever appears in the movie. <laughs> so this scene is totally superfluous. There's no reason for it. Yeah. Because next stop, he's got to go to a pinball bar where there's like the bikini girls rolling around in giant hamster balls. It's uh-huh. a, and uh, everybody's Jerry goes, serving Malaco Plus. Yeah. This is the scene we saw. This is the first thing we saw, and we go, "This is genius." <laughs> this, so we love this. This yeah. is this movie's too much for us. Let's bring it to the flop house. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, this is definitely also the scene that is the most like, oh, you can see that this guy worked on the Avengers TV show. Yes. Like with the pinball yeah. filled with this is beings. This is a brief glimpse at the charm in Dr. Fibes. But yeah, nothing else yeah. really touches that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'll, we'll, there's some other fivesy moments that I like. But uh, okay. there's, so it's a super mod place. He goes to meet up with an assassin played by uh, Ronald Lacey. You may know him best as Tote from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, he's like this super uptight assassin who, again, does not appear in the movie after this scene. So the scene is totally irrelevant. And uh, he's very stressed about pinball. And Jerry wants to buy napalm <laughs> from him. And he says, give me a couple days. Jerry is picked up by a busty lady and then turns down an offer from an elderly fortune teller to have his fortune told. And a bunch of nuns are playing slot machines. That's the scene. Again, doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the movie. Yep. It's it's a it's this move at this point. The movie is daring you to yeah. discover a plot. <laughs> have you have you ever picked up a Thomas Pynchon novel and just started reading? <laughs> doesn't the scientist come up in the the 
pinball bar? Oh yeah, yeah. Doctor Smiles shows up again, but then they show up again. I mean, he keeps coming up. There's no. It's but he keeps yeah. asking for this microfilm. Well, and you then think we there's going to be the plot, but it doesn't yes. really show up yet. The plot doesn't show up till the next scene. There's right. three men in dark suits. These three doctors. One of them, Doctor Powis, is played by George Coloris from Citizen Kane. So there's a little bit of uh, movie history here as well. And they're meeting with Miss Bruner, a sort of uh, uh, super tough, super genius femme fatale lady, uh, and mm-hmm. she does not want Jerry involved in whatever they're doing, this final program they're talking about. Oh, no, they don't. No, she wants him involved. They don't want him involved. And she's got this guy with him, with her name, Dimitri, who we don't know why he's there, but he's like a, we think he's like a bodyguard or a chauffeur or something. But she has and other He looks a lot him. like Matthew McConaughey. He's a dead ringer from McConaughey. He's like a Greek McConaughey. He's like McConopolis. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was going to say one thing, Elliot. Is this okay to interject while you're telling it, or is that, do we save these comments for later. Oh no, keep interjecting because the the way I do it, the only way you're going to get a word in is if you interject. Yeah. So this is this is the time. I was thinking about the pinball scene and how inspired that was and it it, it evokes this kind of use the um the funny thing is is the director also claims to be the set designer, right? Like didn't he design it yeah. too like Yeah, I think so. In the credits it says written directed like design written by, and directed yeah by Robert yeah. Foost or whatever. They use a lot of um inflatables in the movie and so this is the first time you're kind of seeing that thinking and um you know it, it, it it's it, it's kind of like um it's kind of like it, it, it feels like that that is a theme that goes throughout the movie is inflatables. so this is the first time we're seeing that i just want to mention it but also the the nuns at the pinball machine is that kind of thing like it's depra- it's depraved as you can imagine yeah <laughs> It's the end of the world. Yeah. This is where the world is, is that nuns are playing slots and pinball. This yeah. is dogs Doesn't and cats living together. Doesn't this disgust you? <laughs> yeah. It's like same... in Things to Come when the little boy's playing the drum and they're the world's going to war. It's just this is how bad – this is how thick it's going to get for you. <laughs> You're saying that the, that the social satire and commentary on this is pretty subtle and yeah. also measured. Yeah. That there's it's the, like the, it's like when the Ewoks are playing drums on the stormtrooper helmets, and you're yeah. like, "There's a person's head inside that man." I mean, there can't be. A person. <laughs> I mean, they probably took the head out first, or else it wouldn't make as good a sound, right? That's yeah. true. Maybe probably. you never know. Which means you have to imagine an Ewok sticking his head in there and pulling, sticking his hand in there and pulling out a stormtrooper head, and then probably making a puppet out of it or eating it. You know. I mean, he doesn't oh, have, to have to cut his puppet. head. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't have to decapitate him. You can probably remove the helmet without decapitating a person, right? Mm, these are Ewoks. They like to do it. They could have just found the helmet with the head in it. That's true. Yeah. Does yeah. anyone know if Ewoks eat meat or are they fruit eaters? Like, I real- mean, they were good. They were they were literally roasting Han on a spit, right? When they when they yeah. first got him. Yeah. But they might uh-huh. have thought that he was like a like a mangaboo, like a vegetable person, like in the Oz novels. So it's, who knows? <laughs> I mean, the Ewoks you are big know. big L Frank L Frank bomb fans. Uh, so yeah, let's get wicked. Which on is the phone. it's we'll like ask. Zardoz. <laughs> it's like it's like Zardoz. All the Ewoks know about humanity is from the Wizard of Oz. That's it. Okay, so. Guys, these scientists, mm-hmm. uh, they're not happy about okay. it. And uh, the, uh, they, but they need Jerry to get into his house to get that microfilm. Now, we know Jerry is planning to blow up his house, so this could be trouble. But uh, that night, uh, Jerry Cornelius, uh, first he, uh, he tests out this weird little needle gun that he has that his brother Frank also ends up having one. So I don't know if this is a family weapon where in the future people just shoot little needles at each other, but it's like a see through plastic gun. Uh, that looks pretty neat, right? It's like those telephones from the 90s where you could see all the machinery inside. Oh, those were so cool. It had a CO2 cartridge in it, too, which was kind of a nice touch to suggest that the it's CO2 powered, you know? So that yeah. was a cool thing. It's like, the, it's like the plastic gun that John Malkovich uses in In the Line of Fire, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> that one shot little needles, too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At Jerry Cornelius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. What if now? Okay, how different would in the line of fire be if instead of Clint Eastwood, it was Jerry Cornelius? Is this guy playing Jerry Cornelius? It'd be pretty. It would be very different, right? Well, if it, instead of Clint Eastwood, it was Jerry it Cornelius. Would. And I mean, I feel like I feel like Eastwood would have none of uh, no time for the shenanigans of this movie. <laughs> no, because <laughs> <laughs> how different would the final program be if it was Clint Eastwood playing the part instead of John Finch? Again, very different. I don't think it would have been that different. It still would be pretty boring. <laughs> you think still Clint Eastwood still be wearing the ruffled shirt, dark fingernails? I mean, uh, it'd be it'd be fun to look at, like a lot of the final program is, 
Yeah, but, that's true. I mean, how much do you think Clint Eastwood could ad lib a better plot into the script? True. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of how how kind of boring the script is, we get a discussion again, a flashback discussion between uh, Jerry and his professor about uh, how there needs to be a merging of science and spirituality or chaos will erupt. Uh, It's unclear again what this what this means and continues to be. Uh, Miss Brunner shows up. She's read Jerry's books, and that's from before Jerry lost faith in all knowledge. And she says she's a computer programmer who's trying to find the program for immortality. And to finish her work, apparently she needs her dad's, his dad's microfilm. They all go on foot uh, to the house, leaving behind Dimitri, Miss Bruner's devoted assistant, so we think. <laughs> uh, suddenly, uh-oh, red photo negative, red photo negative, bio, bio, visual effects, video effects. The house is blasting them with light. That is supposed to cause pseudo-epilepsy. And Jerry somehow leads them through it by going up ahead, pressing a button on his watch, coming back and getting them, and the lights never never stop. So I don't know what pressing the button on his watch did. Do you guys have any explanation of what he's doing in this scene? Filling time. Uh, Feel, it seems like they, they are filling time quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that I was reading the Wikipedia summary for this movie while the scene was going on to try and figure out what was... That scene really does give you pause because it's very noisy. And, and, it, and it, in some ways it's kind of inspired... Um, in kind of a weird Alphaville kind of way, like this is where there's these blasts of lights that 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 is a deterrent to keep you from getting, you know, to keep people away, right? Like a moat. And so it's shooting these balls of light. And if you watch it, it will give you epilepsy or it will will it kill you or just like d- just really like screw you up. Only one way to find out. Let's get to that house. <laughs> it's very good. So anyway, but I thought that was kind of a I thought that was one of the things that was actually fulfilled in kind of a good way. Like I felt like it was pretty seamless and it was a simple idea. It's just light and sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't a big uh big dip in quality to realize an idea like this. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh the it's so this, but, but this is just one of many traps that they're going to have to go through. They get into the house, which is and super are these deco traps and super designed modern. by his father or are they designed by Frank? This is a question that's not answered. Jerry seems to know his way around, so I'm guessing they were designed by his father. The Cornelius family seems like an interesting family. Uh, there's the, yeah, you know, I'd rather this watch is, a movie about just them. It, <laughs> it feels like uh, it's very like mod gothic. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, there's some hint that Jerry is in love with his sister. Dark shadows. Yeah, it's very dark shadowsy. Yes. Uh, Fra- Frank seems to be uh, possibly also the same. Uh, there's very, it's very um, like if Edgar Allan Poe was like groovy, like <laughs> hey guys, like what if what if the Raven like what if the hey Raven guys, what if Edgar Allan Poe was groovy? Yeah, like what if the Raven turned me. on? Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> wouldn't that be cool? Nevermore, Join baby. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it, it de- diminishes the menace quite a bit if he says "Nevermore, baby," <laughs> and then slips on some shades, and you hear like a guitar, a guitar lick. So, uh, Jerry and Miss Brunner, for some reason, leave the three doctors behind. The three doctors immediately screw something up and have to escape from some poison gas. They escape to a chess puzzle now, room. This, that was five G. With the yes. gas and everything, yeah, that was a great looking scene too. And yeah. that and that and that ballroom really, really felt like two thousand one. Yes, it was really yeah. evoking that vibe of. It did bother me though that in the sort of shot where like they're getting off the elevator and going into that room, that behind them you can clearly see there is no ceiling, and when they cut back there is a ceiling. And I know that's not valid information or useful in any way but it bothered me so i wanted to bring that up <laughs> i'd like i'd like to make that canon i'd like to read that in as an aspect of the house that's meant to throw off intruders is yeah. that oh, okay. pieces of it will swivel around or change shape while you're in there you, know, you can't put anything past, past house cornelius they do all sorts of crazy things in there you, they have a starbucks in their house and it's like where what? are the customers coming from for this starbucks it's in a private mm-hmm. home this doesn't make any sense they're just wacky they're just they're just wacky that way. Yeah, they've the, like one of the bedrooms. The whole floor is a ball pit. Can you believe that? Like this is goofy. Come on, what are they thinking? <laughs> and you know what kind of chairs they have? Let me give you a no. hint. Which, it's a bag, kind? and it's filled with beans. It's a bean bag chair. Oh no, kidding! Wow. <laughs> Anyway, that's disgusting. Yeah, no, and that, well, they, well, that's the thing. It's a bag of <laughs> like cooked beans? cooked beans. Yeah, like refried beans. Yeah, re, it's okay. baked beans and refried beans in a of bag. The bushes baked variety. Yeah, and the bag is a trash bag. It's just a trash bag full of baked beans that they put on the uh, floor. Now, uh, here's a question. Uh, disgustingness aside, do you think it would be more comfortable to sit 
in a beanbag chair full of refried beans than like just a regular. I mean, you need a lot chair. of refried beans to fill that space because it's essentially a liquid yeah, well, mush I mean, at that let's point. Blue sky, this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <you know? laughs> All right. Let's say we've got infinite refried beans. I don't. Well, it would you be like throw a in a little chair. bit of rice, and I'm sure you got a little bit of a stronger foundation. I uh, know yeah. that if you just had beans and that weren't refried. Because let's face it, they put a lot of stuff in refried beans right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, another another rant of Joel's against modern <laughs> refried beans. I've heard it before. If you've got uh, regular beans, I think they're going to function way better. If yeah. you want that beanbag yeah. chair kind of feel, uh-huh. I think so. Mm-hmm. You okay. don't want um, – the refried beans are going to make your beanbag chair behave like Stretch Armstrong ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, it feels like a feature, not a bug. I want to be able to do a snow angel in my beanbag chair. Yeah, I finally uh, feel yes. what it feels like to be wrapped in the warm embrace of Stretch Armstrong <laughs> after all these years of yearning for it. Well, we, yeah, we call it memory beans. Yeah, it's just like, no matter no matter how far his arm stretches, they just can't seem to get all the way around me. So, <laughs> oh, man. Finally, thing you could find on Alibaba though is Probably. a Stretch Armstrong beanbag chair that's just like. <laughs> Really upsetting looking and too big, <laughs> and it's and it's kind of in the. It's the size of like a barber chair. Yeah, where you could go. It's twenty five hundred dollars. Like I could maybe get that. It's yeah. like it wouldn't break me. It's a lot of money to spend on a chair. But man, people would talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I will get this stretch aim string that they have on here. Now I want to uh, hear Elliot compose a torch song for Stretch Armstrong and the time he doesn't get oh. to spend with him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I I'm distracted by the fact that I just said Stretch Armstrong, which makes me think that if of like an Elaine Stretch version of Stretch Armstrong, where it's just her legs kick up really high, I guess, <laughs> while she's while she's singing torch songs. Okay, stretch so. heartthrob. <laughs> That's the uh, so. If anyone wants to mock up, I guess Elaine Stritch singing a torch song to Stretch Armstrong. Let's <laughs> let's do this. Okay, it all rhymes. That's the Kickstarter. Your time. Yeah, that's the Kickstarter. <laughs> Forget Mystery Science Theater. This is what we're kickstarting right now. Okay, <laughs> they go through a bunch of traps. They got to solve a chess puzzle on a wall, and a and a blade comes out. But they get through. It leads them to an inflatable maze. They're like children, just just running, just lost in this place. And uh, this was Jerry my finds them and part. saves them. Yeah, I mean, love, the it's super vaginal. Yeah. Oh yeah. It looks great, and the, all the different colors and stuff. It's. But it, can I stop you, Elliot? It's the, to me. This feels like that moment where, in 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 in, in again, it's two thousand one inspired. Like that changed the movies because I think it was kind of like we collaborate with the youth who are taking drugs and drinking while they watch these films. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. So this is part of their experience. We owe this to them. <laughs> That you know that we're you know it doesn't really have to hold up as a real movie. It's an environment. They'll go in this black room, a theater, take their drugs and marijuana, and watch these, and it'll work. Like, don't you think that was that? It oh. seemed like that was kind of part of this. I think very much. So. I think there, around this time there were a lot of experience movies where mm-hmm. it's more it, you're meant to experience it more than than to like draw a, a plot narrative from it. I have to imagine the big. It, this is I'd like to bring us all back to the year 1968. It's the opening weekend of 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Stanley Kubrick, of course, master perfectionist as he is, is inspecting all the theaters to make sure that the audience are up to his standards. And three young people come in, blasted off their, out of their minds, off of acid, and he, and, and he says, uh, no, 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 I don't think so. And then Arthur C. Clarke is there, and he goes, wait, let them in. Let them watch the movie. And Stanley was like, I put a lot of work into this movie. I don't want people just using it as, as a color and light show. And Arthur C. Clarke goes, no, no, no. I've got a feeling about this, Stanley. And then the uh, and they go in and uh, the and they and they're like, "Whoa, this is amazing!" And uh, and and Stanley Kubrick is is uh, is like, "This is amazing. This is visionary." Yeah, you're right. And now I'll take credit for this forever. And that's the way it happened, guys. That's uh-huh. that's the story. Yeah, I could see wow. that. His, history's fascinating. Yeah. All the way up to Cheech and Chong movies, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, when when, yeah. when when Stanley Kubrick's Up in Smoke came out, that was yeah, it was, uh-huh. it was a big thing. Yeah. I mean, the idea that oh, we don't have to make a real movie. They certainly did <laughs> use that for Cheech and Chong movies. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, and and Arthur C. Clarke's The Corsican Brothers. Okay, no, this is what mm-hmm. we. This is why we do this, Joel. Well, mm-hmm. this is this is not really. I hate to pull back the curtain too much. This is not really for people who want to know what happens in the final program. Uh, but speaking of what happens in the final program, Jerry finds what the butler. What happens in the final program? 
I'm yeah, just about to tell you. Jerry oh. finds the butler who is dying. The butler has failed to get Catherine out. Frank found out about it, poisoned the butler. Jerry finds Catherine asleep. There's slash marks on her arms. There's drugs all over the room. It's a ter- It's not. It's a bad scene, as Jerry Cornelius might say. Mm-hmm. Frank bangs on the door, and uh, Jerry. <laughs> And Jerry has the – there are a couple lines Jerry Cornelius has in this movie where he swears really casually in a way I didn't expect. And he goes – Frank goes, who's in there? I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. And Jerry goes, you know it's me, Frank, and you're shitting yourself. And it's such a like a Toast of London type line. Like, yeah. like <laughs> uh, And Jerry and Frank have a needle gun fight as Frank talks about how great drugs are basically. Frank shoots Jerry, uh, and Jerry thinks he's shooting at Frank, but he shoots Christina. Oh, no. Her fate – I'm not sure whether she dies or not. The whole Chris, the whole Christina plot kind of disappears from this point. It's just a motivation <laughs> for Jerry to go after Frank. But uh, Bruner catches up to Frank, beats him up, and she says, we'll give you drugs if you get us the microfilm. She forces him to open up their dad's safe, but Frank traps them behind some glass because there's so many traps in this house. It's a regular Franco trap house, mm-hmm. and they just – and uh, Frank escapes with the microfilm. And uh, bum, that's when bum, bum. bum bum bum. Now it's a it's a hunt. Now it's the hunt for it's the Sir, Star Trek three, the search for Frank. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry wakes up in a sort of minimalist nursing home where there's only one bed in the middle of a huge empty room. This is some more kind of very two thousand one stuff. You didn't mention who the actor who plays Frank is, and you've like oh, listed extensive it. credits for everyone else. I have no fucking idea. I just thought you would tell oh, me because Frank I was is played by lost. Derek O'Connor, who I know him best at you. I know him best as Bob Hoskins' partner in Brazil. But uh, Stuart, you would know him oh best. Oh my as, god, you're right. Yeah, you would know him best as Ralph in Hawk the Slayer. That's oh, right. Oh shit! This is. Oh, he's also a Deep Rising. It says here. Yeah, and he's in. Oh, shit. He's in Time <laughs> Bandits. Captain Atherton. Yeah. No. Uh, Wait, uh, so he's in he's in lots of stuff. He's yeah. he's another one of these actors where like I saw his face and I was like I know him from stuff and mm-hmm. like he's I was in like that with almost Weapon everyone 2. in this movie. Yeah, yeah, he's in. Uh, let's see, what other stuff is he in that you might know? Uh, of course, he, yeah, he's in the movie, the first movie of Daredevil. First movie. There's only one. Why am I saying uh, the first? Yeah. Uh, uh, you probably know him. End of days. Uh, Dan, you know him best, of course, as Dean Reed from How to Make an American Quilt. And uh, uh-huh. you know he's in he's in lots of stuff, but he's this is his. Uh, Second appearance in a Flophouse film. Mm. Anyway. That's a great quality, and I did recognize them, and you, they kind of cast him as this kind of character type character. Pretty gross. He's pretty, he comes off as like kind of a pretty – he's like if Richard Keel was, sh- was shorter, uh-huh. like I feel like. Uh, sure. And he's got a real bad guy quality about him. He looks like a guy who's strung out on drugs in the future of the 1970s. Uh, so – uh, Jerry Cornelius wakes up in this nursing home. They tell him he had an accident at a carnival, uh, and he has another flashback about his his professor that doesn't really matter. Uh, Miss Brunner picks up Jerry Cornelius and takes him to eat at a restaurant that's ringside at a kind of milk slash mud wrestling pit. This is more mm-hmm. kind of like wacky, the future is decadent type stuff. And there is a very long scene where Jerry is bantering with a waitress played by Sandra Dickinson, who was Trillian in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV show. And she's got kind of like a uh, like a Harley Quinn type voice. And uh, Betty like Boopish. a cigarette girl box of like water or wine or... Well, well yeah, it's like There's she's presenting box. Wi- wine, like the equivalent of wine, but it's like, here's some like uh, toxic waste from the... Champagne region of France or whatever, like, like uh, it's a joke. It's, a, it's all jokes. one of these hilarious counterculture jokes. Yeah. Also, the cool. music that they used was what is is that really tough oompa kind of music that's yeah. to evoke like this is funny though we're not really willing to put the time in to make this funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like the, it's, the yeah. actors, the actors are gonna make you believe what what's going on is interesting and. When they look over their shoulders and they'll laugh at it, this was where I began to hate this movie. <laughs> I began to go, why are you doing yeah. this? Because it's so lazy. It's that, again... It's like putting the Wallace and Gromit theme over 1984. It just It's not doing it any favors. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, and it's that thing, too, where you run into it. Like Anytime they do a movie about stand-up, they always just there's very few of them that actually use real stand up that's funny and that you're you it, it they indicate it's funny because they have the audience laugh at it so mm-hmm. that was really discouraging but that music plays throughout this scene it's a really long scene and it's supposed to be funny because they're ordering toxic waste to drink like wine mm-hmm. yeah and i i also feel like i was like watching it being like oh, okay like 
<laughs> this is like the most basic uh, thought in the world, and I've said it many times on the flop house, but I'm like, oh, in a better movie, that might have worked. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you just, if you just sort of like tossed away that line, like if it was just like a moment in a comedy and didn't like, everything feels very leaden when they yeah. try and do comedy. Yeah, yeah if, if it had... was a villain in like Robocop 5 ordering toxic waste, yeah, drink, exactly. I'd be like, oh, cool, that makes sense. Sure, sure. Uh, the uh, or it's it's a uh, it is a it is a poor step cousin to the restaurant scene in Brazil where the woman mm. keeps offering him like like it's always goes pepper and then explodes you know because uh, yeah. there's been a terrorist attack. <laughs> the, now, or, uh, now, do you think they they shot this scene in a it's in like a club with a milk mud wrestling ring? Now I know that Adam Sandler likes to shoot his movies wherever he wants to go on vacation. <laughs> do you think that they were just like we're already going here? We might as well shoot a fucking scene here. Let's see if people will sign the release, and then we'll just shoot it here. Yeah. It's possible. I mean, we'll have to look into how many Milk Mud Wrestling clubs there were in London at the time. Um, yeah. You'd be probably surprised. a lot. Probably yeah. a lot. And you know that Chris Claremont was right there watching it the whole time. Uh oh, <laughs> that's for the people who know about Chris Claremont, X Men writer, X Men legends, uh, sexual peccadilloes. True nasty uh, boy. Anyway, so um, they so Miss Brunner's there. They both want to find Frank. Him for revenge. Her for the microfilm, and they kind of come to an agreement that they're going to do this. Uh, they go to Jerry Cornelius' apartment. It is a mess. She calls a computer for information while he goes and takes a ton of – his freezer is just overflowing with biscuits, what we would call cookies, and what in <laughs> England they call biscuits. And Thanks. he's – he uh, there's liquor bottles everywhere. He has a coffee vending machine in his apartment because, again, these are the Corneliuses. They like – they're just like the Starbucks in their house. They love to be able – they love to pay money but for coffee in somehow, their own home. somehow this is the most average place in the whole movie. Like, it's got its quirks, but, like, there's still something kind of real and boring about it. Yeah, well, he still has, like, a couch. You know, he has yeah. furniture. It's filled with bottles, too. Isn't the whole idea that every counter is lined with empty booze bottles in this yes. scene? Yes, yeah. Because yeah. he lives in a sort of uh, a Dr. Gonzo, uh, Raul Duke, constant mm. haze of, of chemicals, uh, but mostly liquor. Uh, and he quotes the Spanish Inquisition sketch, uh, you know, because so again, you know, it's a comedy because they they have a joke from a funny thing in it. And uh, Jerry hits on Miss Brunner's assistant and is lightly rebuffed. And as in Norwegian Wood, crawls off to sleep in the bath. Uh, he's brushing his teeth uh, very angrily with his and then, foot in the sink. Yeah, and he looks <laughs> in a very uncomfortable posture. Yes, and he, he sees in the mirror reflection that the assistant is now playing piano naked. Uh, and he watches this for a little bit and then again crawls off to sleep in the bath. And uh, he, the, we see the assistant at first it seems like is about to have sex with Miss Brunner. But as it becomes clearer later on, she is going through some sort of process of consuming and absorbing the assistant into her own body, which is represented by her holding her fist in the air while choral music plays, kind of like mm -hmm. divine choral music. Uh, this is one of those things where I, it was just an inkling I had that I had to look up the description later to find out. If that was actually happening. Yes, uh, Joel Hudson, you had a question. I mean, I'm just kind of trying to re reiterate and with my hand what happened in the movie because mm -hmm. <laughs> there is this kind of effect that happens yeah. where it, like it kind of it's statter, it's yeah, it shudders. And yeah. and I didn't catch that in the least. Like that's what's either. amazing. I didn't get that, but that that actually makes sense somehow. So yeah. you're saying yeah. she she somehow got a way to absorb people and we we know that that comes later but so you're saying she's starting that process yes yeah i think so yeah. i mean i was a little confused because normally when i make love to somebody my body shudders in that weird stop stop mm -hmm. thing stop yeah. and, and motion, angelic yeah. music plays right yeah. yeah i thought that was like <laughs> yeah. i thought that was like just a stylistic showing of like the ecstasy of sex or sextasy if you will mm -hmm. but um I won't. Yeah, I did not get that at all. That's that's what I thought was the joke at first was that it was yeah it was a joke about how good this this erotic moment right. is and because they couldn't Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah I assume was not maybe hadn't been written yet so they couldn't play that yeah. so they Inspired, went for the, right. it was inspired by the scene <laughs> yeah that's what it was yeah. he was he Leonard Cohen saw this movie and he misunderstood what was going on in the scene so he went and wrote that song and he said someday two superheroes are gonna do it in a big metal owl <laughs> to this song. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, in the the next morning, the assistant is gone. Uh, we now know that she's been eaten, but it's unclear at the time. They go to a train station because Miss Brunner's computer said that Frank would be there, and he is. Uh, it this it takes a long time for this to happen. He's picked up by ba Doctor Baxter, 
who is a former colleague but now enemy of Jerry Cornelius' late father. And Dr. Baxter is played by Patrick McGee, who is a big, big actor in a lot of stuff. Uh, but you might remember him best as the author in Clockwork Orange who gets beaten up by Alex and the Droogs. Mm. Uh, so – uh, here he's a bad guy, though, and that one he was a victim. Uh, they drive off and they follow him. Uh, Frank talks to Baxter for a little bit. Frank wants to sell the microfilm, but he doesn't know what's on it. Uh, and Frank thinks he killed Jerry Cornelius, but Baxter's like, oh, I just saw him. I, I think he's still alive. I think I just saw him the other day or earlier. Cue dart gunfight and foot chase. While, they're, while Jerry and Frank are running through a junkyard, which I guess represents modern society or something, sure. uh, to some <laughs> jazz music, uh, Miss Brunner – kind of seduces Dr. Baxter and then absorbs him in the exact same way, fist upraised, choral music playing. There was jazz uh, music? Jazz music during the during the chase, I believe, if I'm remembering it correctly. I only remember the Oompa music. Maybe it was maybe I was so maybe in my mind had blocked out the marching band music at that point and was just playing other things I might enjoy more. <laughs> You sounded so disturbed too, like, like I missed jazz. <laughs> I'm well, just that's like, shocked. Like, that's why yeah. around the Mystery Science Theater gets said he was known as Jazz McGinnis because he just always had to tell us about jazz. <laughs> he'd be like, he'd be like, this guy, you know who also riffs? Coltrane. And we'd be like, yeah, we get it, Matt. We get it. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about is this movie for a science fiction fantasy film doesn't have a single establishing shot showing you where you are or what, yeah, where in context you are. There's, there's that one scene where he's walking in a city and there is a there is kind of a process shot of a bunch of cars stacked mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. And that's the only time they do any kind of special effects um, photography to indicate a, a sense of place. And I think if they would have used that more, this would have been a better movie. I think yeah, that's I think it right. would have been a clearer movie. I, that, and that scene, that, that shot, it wasn't until I read the Wikipedia entry that I realized that was a shot of Trafalgar Square. And it was supposed to be showing that it's full of detritus. But it's, yeah, that's the oh. only shot where I was like, it's like, oh, well, this is, yeah, this is an establishing shot. And I still don't know where it is or what's going on. I just well, thought it was like the first step into like the WALL-E universe where like we could just put trash everywhere. Oh, yeah. Well, this is, mm-hmm. WALL-E is the sequel to the final program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a, well, and there's the, when he's chase uh, when Jerry's chasing Frank, he chases him into a large building and we get like a helicopter shot, right? Where the the camera like you mm-hmm. see them run in, and then you can see through the courtyard Frank like run from one door to another. That actually is a great shot. That's actually yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, so Jerry shoots Frank, uh, killing him. The Frank plot line is now over, uh, <laughs> and Aww. we're off onto the microfilm plot line, the final program of the original plot t- of title. Bruner takes the microfilm, and Jerry. Just starts drinking. His whole family is gone, and so rightfully he's he's about to get drunk. And then Miss Brunner is like, and and he talks to Miss Brunner, and he seems to know that she eats people. <laughs> like it's it just comes up casually yeah. in conversation. I was like, oh okay, so that's you knew that was happening. And you didn't try to stop it or anything like that. You just felt that was all right. Okay. Uh, and she says, come to Lapland. Come with me to see Duel, the most complex computer in the world. And he's like, I've seen it. Steven Spielberg, the truck's chasing a guy. <laughs> like, I understand. I don't I don't need to see it again. I saw it. Uh, but instead, they, they, they're they going to go to Lapland. Wherever Lapland is in relation to them, it is a mere hot air balloon right away because they step into a waiting <laughs> hot air balloon and and just head over there. <laughs> they, t- they, they toss them up, it's out. And <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it. it's one of these, it's like they're trying to, there was something about, in the early scene when he gets into a helicopter, and just flies off there was something a little surprising of like what and it's like they're trying to pick up on the fumes of that and they're like how do we heighten from helicopter hot air balloon Mm. that'll seem whimsical there's a lot of uh misplaced whimsy or mimsy in this and i wish it was the last mimsy to be honest Mm -hmm. so anyway (laughs) elliot yeah (laughs) don't do that (laughs) sorry i was just i i wanted to be gene shallot for a moment that works i wanted to just tell him not to do it Uh, when matt when matt tells me when matt tells me it works for a couple minutes okay uh, they show up at a kind of pod in Lapland where the three scientists are, and they're like, what is Jerry doing here? We don't want him here. Our experiment is at a crucial moment. And they, there's so much – this whole scene – this whole se- sequence is full of so much science fiction techno mumbo-jumbo gobbledygook that I love so much because it's like there's, – there's just so much made-up science language. 
but uh, there the uh, Jerry goes off and finds there's a, like a it's a vintage submarine at an underground dock and talks about how he used to have a submarine too and it turns out this is a, a secret Nazi lab that was left over after World War II and Jerry and they they're continuing I guess the experiment that was started there and Jerry's like oh the world's about to end soon and they show him that Dimitri uh, the assistant that was left in the car earlier is living in a kind of glass bedroom uh, which well remember it, too uh, earlier. He does say in the lemon grove or whatever it was, there's a the only line I remember is when he says, The world is ending, I'm gonna go watch it on television. Mm-hmm. Which also seemed like another one of those just like, Oh, the future's so dismal because of television and stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, there's, uh, this, yeah. There's, there's a line later where someone says something about like the the third, third world war or something like that and he's like it's already going on just people get distracted by the commercials and it's like that's right. a- almost a satirical idea but it's not really yeah. like it's you're getting there yeah yeah they're getting it's baby steps baby steps mm-hmm. uh, evolutionary steps as we'll see later in the movie uh oh. anyway uh, they showed jerry duel which is a kind of hilariously small computer it's like the size of a paper shredder which would be accurate for now like you don't need but back then it's it's a very unimpressive looking computer <laughs> with with a fucking title plate on it that says most advanced computer in the world do not touch (laughs) (laughs) the only thing i can compare that to is when i was recently an audience member on jeopardy and they had us wait in the wheel of fortune set for a while he brings this up every episode guys and that the wheel of fortune was under a thick layer of uh, plastic sheeting and there was a sign that said do not touch wheel under any circumstances (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's happened so many times. That's so many so times. Great. And I just wondered what people's excuses were for why they had to touch the wheel at that moment. <laughs> I think, too, that in this, in the laboratory, they really step up their game as far as art direction goes. And this is when, this is again where Matt and I was watch. This is when we happened to watch it the first time and said, wow, I'm really enthused about this movie because. <clears throat> Zardoz do, did this really elegantly as well, where there's um, a kind of a, a the simple society, and then there's these sci-fi elements that kind of are in pockets throughout the the you know the kind of pastoral farm community, and this had the same this had the same kind of vibe where you hit this pocket, and I thought it I thought it was pretty nice looking throughout the rest of the movie. It was kind of like a a peak. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. But now what I like also is that it's it's kind of got a, a mod style to it, but the secret lab looks like something that people threw together in a pre existing room, which I mm-hmm. really liked, as opposed to every X Men villain has a secret lab that looks like it was built by a, a crew of hundreds. And I'm just like, was Mr. Sinister really like using an electric screwdriver, like installing all these panels to cover up all the wiring. <laughs> like, or did, did, there's no way that Apocalypse hired a contractor to do this. So was he really like lying down underneath the underneath the counter, like wiring up his, you know, all of his big computers yeah. and stuff? But this looks <laughs> like a right. place. I, I can't believe comic books anymore. Tying up, tying you're, up you're the cables really... so he doesn't trip on them or they don't get confused. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Scales are falling from my eyes yeah. on this one. They know that Apocalypse is like, oh, I need more zip ties to get <laughs> get these cables into bundles. <laughs> and, he, and he goes to the, he goes to the store and he's and he doesn't have a credit card or like ca- or some I guess maybe he needs cash to pay for this so like is he going in like pawning ancient Egyptian artifacts or something like that like what does apocalypse have, have that's to assume. valuable yeah good point anyway and then suddenly he's he's got to prove the provenance of it it's so either that to... or he's out there busking hustling to get that bag you <laughs> again know? a movie yeah. I would rather see yeah you've got the, this <laughs> immortal mutant apocalypse who has wires that for some reason go from his elbows to his torso and a big belt buckle that says a and he's just playing a violin on a subway platform to get enough money to pay for these zip ties for his cable bundles anyway mm. uh, they take him so uh, Miss Brunner writes goodbye on the wall of Dimitri's room and it fills with gas and they take Jerry to my favorite room in the whole place which is the brain room it's just fake brains <laughs> in fish tanks with liquid and wires going into them and mm-hmm. they're like oh yeah we're harnessing all all the knowledge of these brilliant brains so we can feed all human knowledge into this computer and then feed it back into the head of the perfect immortal person which seems like an extra step that maybe they don't need but i don't know and they're like they want we can't seem to crack feeding all the knowledge into a human brain so here's a solution two human brains two and it's brains. and it's like that wasn't your first solution like i don't understand you've already got a bunch of brains like that's literally how life works is that human knowledge is distributed throughout multiple brains so the idea that like wait i got it 
two brains. There's a real Elon Musk quality of it where it's like, I'm a genius. You know how people should travel in cities? Tunnels. How come nobody ever thought of this brilliant idea before? <laughs> Uh, it's isn't so good on rediscovering human civilization, one invention at a time. So uh, they explain to Jerry Cornelius in more interesting words than this that his dad built a kind of prism chamber. He built it in Lapland because Lapland gets six weeks of uninterrupted sunlight, and the non-setting sun puts all this solar radiation that's going to be stored up in this prison. We're going to put two people in there at just the right moment. Then we're going to combine them into a double-brained, self-regenerating, immortal superperson. Uh, I'm going to mention they throw the word hermaphrodite around here. It's kind of a problematic word for them to be using yeah. here. It's not really necessary for what they're talking about. Uh, they I'd, they were going to merge Miss Brunner and Dimitri, but now Miss Brunner wants to use Jerry. And who wouldn't? Why wouldn't you want to be one half of an immortal super being that is an alcoholic addicted to chocolate biscuits who <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> cannot get through a single day without pissing off everybody around him? And it's just kind of like mopey all the time. He didn't think about it very much either when she asked him. He just kind of went, okay. <laughs> yeah. It is worth noting too to really reiterate the fact that he's an alcoholic. He has like a small kind of wet bar in the dashboard of his car. So and he just pops pills into as well when he's drinking. So yes, very much like not even like a textbook alcoholic, like kind of like a comic strip <laughs> alcoholic. Yeah, custom build bar <laughs> on the dashboard of his yeah. car. Yeah, well, this... like like Andy Cap is like, bro, you need to cool out for a little bit. Go home to your <laughs> <Yeah>. wife, <laughs> dude. Have some hot fries. Go home. Sleep it off. Have forty years of a comic strip that's not funny and get back. To <laughs> <laughs> that is, there is like I I don't know enough about the origins of Andy Cap, but I, it's like I assume it's built off of that like uh, some some the love of the dad from Mister Doolittle from uh, My Fair Lady, where it was like. English drunks, lower class English drunks are hilarious. Like we, this is the this is the new part of culture. The same way that there was like that hillbilly culture craze in America for a while. It's like the Lockhorns too for British people. Like right, like Andy Cap and his wife can't get along. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> except for there's more implication that Andy Cap is perhaps violent. I don't know. <laughs> well, with the Lockhorns, I always assumed that. That is a message that is being sent by the United States government secretly to aliens or demons that have threatened the earth. And it's that they, they've they said, you need to send us messages in the Lockhorns or else we're going to destroy your planet. And it's uh-huh. like uh, every day we got to have another Lockhorns ready for them. It's the only thing that it's the only thing that tells them the message of what's going on. Like it wouldn't surprise me if the, if the news tomorrow was like, oh, it turns out KGB agents were sending messages through the Lockhorns for, for 50 years <laughs> to their American sleeper agents. Uh Kind of a new appreciation for the Lockhorns. Wow! You know, it's no pogo, right? Come on. I mean, it is no pogo. Don't oh, don't don't slam pogo around. It's not around even a Dan. Beetle Bailey. Now, here's the thing about Beetle Bailey. So, uh-huh, go on. Uh, so, tell Beetle me Bailey, about Beetle Bailey. So, Beetle Bailey is the brother of High from High uh, from Lois from High and Lois, right? Like that's how yes, that's where they come true. from. So, how is it? I'm trying to come up with some. Well, I guess the analogy would be that like Beetle Bailey is to High and Lois as Perfect Strangers is to Family Matters. Does that mean anything to anybody? Is that should that be on the SATs? I mean, it means something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what I mean, it the means. Sense that, but... like, it means it's yeah, past Elliot's sculpt bedtime. It out of, <laughs> sculpt it out of mashed potatoes and say this means something. Because but... yeah. I have this, I have this yarn board of spinoffs that I wanted to show you uh, <laughs> that proves that High and Lois and Family Matters take place in the same universe. Uh, Okay, so guys, uh, Dimitri, he escapes. He uh, he attacks Jerry. They fight. There's a couple funny lines that Jerry has here that, again, he is, he is a hero who is very okay with openly talking about how he, he is bad at fighting and is just, and is just aggressive. And he has a line where he goes, help, Miss Brunner, I'm losing, which I think is – which to <laughs> yeah. me was a funny line. You know, and they're constantly like, like tripping, falling over things. The pieces of the set that are there all fall over very easily. Like, yeah, yeah. If there's a can in that room, it's not full of anything. <laughs> was was it that fight scene or was it one earlier where there was that exchange with like um oh i'll staple your balls to the inside of your thighs i don't have any everybody has thighs yeah like, that's, that... earlier. that's earlier <laughs> there's a there's a couple of, there's a couple of wisecracks uh this this fight Stuart, you're right reminds me of the fight mystery science theater connection in the episode future war which seems to take place in an empty cardboard box yeah. warehouse <laughs> <laughs> that just like they need things for them to bump into but 
don't want to fill those things. They think, okay, uh, Miss Brenner shoots Dimitri, but they've got to hurry to pull off this experiment. Uh, they put Jerry in the chamber. He's kind of out of it. Miss Brenner comes in in a kind of see-through nighty, and uh, the scientists bicker a lot. And Jerry and Brenner have kind of like – it's not quite wrestling, and it's not quite sex, and it's not quite a fight. They just kind of roll over each other over and over again they while they tumble. talk. They have a tumble. Yeah, they're just tumbling. Yeah. 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 Uh, they, they, uh, and uh, there's a, the screen gets all psychedelic, and the brains are not happy about it, the brains in the in the jars. And the scientists are like, ah, oh, we're in pain, and they're falling down, and I'm not sure why. And when the lab yeah. is a mess when it's all done, and you see that one of the scientists, his shirt is just gone. He's just not I'm wearing so it anymore. I'm somebody else noticed that. Okay. <laughs> I was like, what's, what scenario was going on where either his reaction was that he ripped his shirt off or somehow the solar radiation energy just tore his shirt off, but everyone else's shirts are fine. Well, also, like, all the scientists, like, after the end of this are, like, all but one are, like, dead on the floor, uh-huh. but you don't actually see them injured, per se. They're just in pools of blood, yes. so you're not really sure what Lots happened. Of yeah. blood. Well, like, yeah. almost too much blood for a person. Yeah. Now, yeah. now... You have just ushered in a new age of humanity. All the scientists are dead. Mm-hmm. There's blood everywhere. Is this a circumstance when I can touch the wheel of fortune? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta refer, I gotta refer you to the sign. It says under no circumstances. I'm, I apologize. I know that, and I, you'd have more luck touching the actual wheel of fortune that will move us out of Kali Yuga and into the next age of, <laughs> sure. of spiritual and human development than touching that one. And I guess you're gonna have to talk to. Uh, I don't. It's not a. It's not a Merv Griffin production. I don't think. I don't remember who makes Wheel of Fortune. But uh, you're gonna have to talk to them. But under no circumstances, it says. Yeah, uh, no, that's too bad. The door opens. We get a double vision point of view shot. That's right. It's another thing like Westworld, where you see the point of view of a superior being, and it looks worse than normal human vision. Uh, it's weird. It's walking through the lab. <laughs> it finds Dimitri, and uh, and Dimitri says, uh, "Are you the Messiah?" And Jerry, you hear Jerry's voice say, "I don't know. Let's just say." It's the end of an age. And then we see Jerry, and he's very clearly not the Messiah. He is the caveman from Altered States, uh, but kind of like <laughs> hunched over and with too much yeah. makeup on. And he goes, see you around, sweetheart, in a Humphrey Bogart voice. And then just kind of – he, he and We have to stop right here. <laughs> okay. this yeah, was, let's digest. This uh, is the thing that – This is when the movie that, broke you for sure. That Matt and I saw, <laughs> Okay. and it was a bit troubling, and it, it was one of those things – I mean – I think that there's confusion in this movie, but there were a few moments of win- windows of like really and a really exciting idea. But that was so fucking weird. <laughs> he says that, and then we, later, later Matt and I kept like trying to remember exactly what he said. Like, did he say twenty three skidoo? <laughs> hey, uh. I got a snort in the back of my truck. Like we couldn't remember. It was like, here's looking at you kids, but it could have been anything, right? Like, well, it, yeah. was, it was more so that it was a Humphrey Bogart impression. Like we were so thrown off by that, that we couldn't remember the actual line. And we just kept thinking to ourselves, like, why was it a Humphrey Bogart well, that's impression? The th- that's one of the things that dates this movie so much is even more than like his clothes is that, that was the resur- That was the time of the Humphrey Bogart resurgence when, like, Humphrey Bogart stuff was really cool for young people because he was considered the most counterculture of the classic Hollywood stars. So, like, you got to bring that back. That's why, like, uh, like, um, play it again, Sam. Like, stuff like that exists was because it was like, oh yeah, Bogart. And, like, uh, so, but it's it dates it mo- more than anything that at that moment this guy who's supposed to be right. like a counterculture figure is like. Humphrey Bogart impression that'll show I'm cool and and like jokey, you know. The, the kids will also, get it. It is also so strange this creature that he turns into because, you know, that J- Jerry is is supposed to be this like ultra cool, you know, drugs and partying like, but also brilliant guy. Miss Bruner is this like. You know, seductress who uh, is also like a, a, a praying mantis, like eats uh, those she mates with. And you kind of expect once they emerge at the end into this super being that it's going to be this kind of like beautiful androgynous, like Tilda Swinton, David Bowie, like everyone's struck by how gorgeous. Yeah, I was expecting like the things at the end of Dark Crystal. 
Oh, yeah, but instead okay. it's like, oh, here's a caveman yeah. who talks like Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's the ultimate apex of human evolution is a caveman who talks like Humphrey Bogart and <laughs> walks with a sort of like jaunty kind of like shuffle uh, yeah. and, and has bad vision, needs glasses. And they put a lot of work into that because it was a really seamless makeup. Even his body was mm-hmm. misshapen and there were a lot of prosthetics all over his body and that was really well done. And, and the idea that, yeah, like you said, Elliot, it's like the accumulation of all human knowledge, <laughs> the, the thing it must do is let you know that it's seen an old Humphrey Bogart. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so wrong. Yeah. And, and at the same time, it, it was chilling. It's, it was <laughs> chilling to me, and I don't know exactly why. I think, I think so this is, this is an example, much like the movie Cats, of an of a perfect execution of a flawed concept, I think. Where like they, I think, I think the, the director watched this and was like, "This is exactly what I am going for. There is no compromises." He's a he's a kind of caveman. He knows Humphrey Bogart. That he, he's going to wander out and say it's a very tasty world. We're going to have a, more psychedelic lights and a sort of psychedelic version of a Looney Tunes end ring <laughs> around the screen, and and yeah. then. Yeah. He was, he was Bugs Bunny. That's yeah. what was so weird. Yeah. Is yeah. that he's almost he's almost being as flip as Bugs Bunny. It's like, I thought I took a left that Albuquerque. You know, it <laughs> seems like the supreme being is talking like Bugs Bunny now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and he just yeah. kind of saunters into oblivion. But yeah, he's he walking just... on water, right? He's walking on water and it's this kind of murky um it's kind of this murky world that's ahead of you that isn't at all. We're not inside the building anymore. It's like a primordial swamp that he's walking out into. So that doesn't track either. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, never have I wanted to be in a like a festival critic screening of a movie <laughs> as I would have wanted to be in a movie theater in 1973, hearing yeah. the reaction in the end. <laughs> well, I have to say too, when, when I first watched this, like generally I look at the movie like by myself and decide if it's something I want to have Joel take a look at too. And like, so you mentioned like her see through nighty and there's kind of like a lot of nudity in the third act. And I remember telling Joel, like I found this really weird movie, but I don't think it's right for the show. Like it has a fair amount of nudity in it. And he was like, Oh, well how much? Like maybe, maybe we can cut around it. I was like, well in the end shot, it's just like a butt, like for the (laughs) whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think we can cut around it. (laughs) Mm. So it's a uh, yeah. I think that it was this is a movie, when it first started. I was like, oh yeah, I, I had a similar thing. Where I was like, I could see why they would do this as a mystery science theater movie. And then yeah, it was throughout it. It was it was a little too grown up. And then yeah, it's just a caveman's butt walking yeah. away. I I have to admit that the I guess when we get to final judgments, I'll, I'll elaborate on this. But like when they all the stuff of that secret lab is really playing directly to my tastes. And that but then as soon as he comes out and he's a Humphrey Bogart spouting caveman i was Did like you say All humphrey right. bogart as in humphrey, like a ghost as, yeah as a, I, I talk we talk a lot about ghosts in my family and also boogers so there's a, a okay. side in me humphrey bogart is i mean now he is humphrey bogart right you know yeah let's be honest it's been long ago. <laughs> yep yeah he's legally you have to re, you have to refer to him that way let's yeah. call a spade a spade sam spade thank <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> now uh, i just while we were while we were talking i was looking up the imdb trivia about this movie apparently uh timothy dalton was originally supposed to play the Jerry Cornelius role what? and they were, hoping, they were hoping that Vanessa Redgrave would play Miss Brunner and I, w- I wonder Whoa. if they'd be able to, to pull it off also this is uh, trivia according to Michael Moorcock who visited the set George Caloris was very baffled by the script which no. seems like mm. not shouldn't be trivia should be just taken for yeah. granted that yeah. whoever was in the movie yeah. was baffled by it <laughs> also audiences were <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um. but do you think that that they would that having those got, having an actual James Bond not yet but eventual and a red grave would have carried this movie or not i think it would have stepped up the intensity of both of those characters yeah that's fair yeah i uh yeah, they all they both seemed kind of like, oh, these are people that I understand why I didn't quite know who they were. <laughs> like they're fine, but okay. yeah, it is interesting for a movie to not give us a single likable character. Okay, like, so it now it's kind of audacious. So yeah. now fantasy casting. 
Okay, but what if it was Paul Rubens and Cindy Lauper? Do you think they would have been able to carry that? Sign me up. Wow. Okay. Sign me yeah, up. Yeah, I do. Okay, here's do another think. one. Here's another one. This is an interesting pairing. Polly Shore and Agnes Moorhead. Do you think they'd be able to pull it off? <laughs> wow, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. I'd be curious. Um, this felt this movie felt to me like it was Rocky Horror without the music or fun. Mm. You know what I mean? Okay. It was yeah, kind of like they yeah, were recreating yeah. life and it had that kind of Cavaliers uh, 60s vibe like uh, everybody's, uh, you know, sexual sexual norms are out the window now. Let's just mm-hmm. have fun with it. And it kind of felt like that as well. That kind of alt uh, sci-fi fantasy vibe is yeah. is throughout this movie as well. But what I thought was so hard was they never had a moment where Jerry Cornelius was not um, just depraved and not just didn't care about anything. So how do you have a movie with that? That Or is this for final, our final judge? Well, well, and you know what? Let's, yeah, let's go let's, into it. Yeah. I just um, found that really hard. Like when does he stop being flipped? Like every fight he's in, he's joking. Like it doesn't matter if I'm alive or dead it doesn't matter if the world's alive or dead, like, like that kind of, it, 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 it almost can't, you almost can't relate to it uh, as a normal person and go, why is, why should I care? You don't, you're rich and you don't care. So wh- what is, what are we supposed yeah. to do with that? Yeah. He's, he's like not cool enough to be a cool cynic and he's not like, or to be a romantic cynic. And He's not. It's not like like the arc of the movie is to show him that life is worth living as long as you have the chance to become an immortal, two-brained Humphrey Bogart quoting caveman. Yeah. Like, although he does say he does, actually, you know what? He does say he walks out and he says he says it's a very tasty world. Like maybe that is that's his arc is that like he realizes this is what I needed. I needed to be covered with hair. I needed mm-hmm. to have knowledge of all Humphrey Bogart. Maybe he's never seen a Humphrey Bogart movie, yeah. and he's never seen anything he really connects with. And all human knowledge included, like, in a lonely place and stuff like that. And now he's like, I get it. There are people out there like me. Not like me. I have two brains and I'm a caveman. But like me. And so finally I can I can live in this world. Whereas there, before there was no one like me, a Nobel Prize winning alcoholic scientist who's in love with his sister possibly and has a CO2 needle gun. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. All right. Elliot, shut up. We gotta get the we gotta get our special guests out of here. So let's do our final judgments uh, fast, uh, which is where we say if it's a good bad movie, a bad bad movie, or movie, a movie we kind of like, you know, good bad, you know, movie. Yeah, you, you know, know. We have fun watching because it's so bad. You know, you know. Uh, but like, I don't think that these categories work. Unfortunately, <laughs> <This> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the, uh, Joel and Matt, you should know that almost every episode the categories don't match up really well no, to what no, we're this, doing. <laughs> yeah, I. I want to say that, like, my experience of this is, like, I, I, I'm i mildly glad I saw it, but the pleasures of this movie for me are all kind of, like, like pop culture nerd intellectual, where I'm like, okay, let me try and parse where this fits into, like, culture. Like, okay, it's got this counterculture thing, and it's, like, mod English, but it also fits into, like, this particular counterculture, like, a uh, trend within science fiction writing and it's got that vibe of like the avengers or like even like hammer films or whatever so like trying to place it and trying to understand the currents of culture that put this nonsense in front of my b- brain mm-hmm. is kind of where i found the fun in it but uh i yeah. don't know what do you guys think i i agree i think that um it's an artifact. It's this kind of like confection. I had never heard, I've never heard of this movie ever or seen an image from it. And, and it was that thing where, again, cause when Matt and I kind of jumped through it, you know, it's kind of like, we'll watch it and we'll go, let's go downstream and we'll go 10 minutes down and watch some more. And each time we were watching it, there was something kind of interesting going on. And, and then we go, oh, this is great. And we didn't know what the rules were for the flop house. And we, we were going, can we watch the movie? Should we watch the movie? And so we didn't watch it. We thought maybe we were going to watch it all together. So we didn't watch the whole mm-hmm. thing. And then last night we watched the whole thing. So it was kind of yeah. like that. But but I feel the same way. And it's it's kind of like, um, like, um, like Dan was saying, it's kind of like this 
it's fun to see the connection that how this movie seems other movies together that were trendy and that they were kind of borrowing things from. So it's almost like a composite drawing of a bunch of other <laughs> movies with mm -hmm. a little, with a narrative that's strung together that isn't working because nobody gets excited about rich people that are bored. Yeah. Like it just can't work. So that was what, yeah, I guess that's my take on Unless it. Unless you're Tennessee Williams. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah and you're mm -hmm. writing about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess the only thing I can say is that out of all the movies I've seen, this was one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. yeah. I'm, you know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's reaction the thing from the movie. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. You're yeah. quoting the. Was it? The, I didn't even yeah. realize. Out of all the. Uh, what, what was it? What did so they do? Out of all the I've movies the movie. we've riffed, this is one of them, or out of the movie. All the movies you'll see this year, this is one of them. I think that's... It. Oh, that's like the tagline <laughs> for the movie, right? Yes. Oh, okay. We'll follow up with you. Come on. We'll oh, come I'm back tired. <laughs> come on, go ahead. I think it's something original. Stuart, what did you want to say? Uh, I mean, I have I have a limited amount of patience for like 70s surreal weirdo stuff. Uh, I mean, I like <laughs> The Visitor, and The Visitor is pretty cool, and that's, you know, weird. But, the Visitor's uh, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, this just didn't have... I, it, it felt like alternately like it was trying too hard and it wasn't trying to let me like or let me like any of the characters at all. So, yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of the final program. Uh, I'm glad it's the last one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot, no I swear, from... if you do another Mimsy joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned my lesson. I'm not doing any more jokes about Mimsies. So uh, I'm going to I feel like my reaction to this is a little different than you guys. This is a movie that I didn't that I actually kind of liked a little bit. It is mm. slow. It makes no sense. Uh, and you're right. The characters give you nothing to latch on to. And the story is not that interesting. But I'm a real sucker for 70s science fiction stuff and 70s kind of weirdness stuff. And like I said, the, any I'm, I'm a fan of almost any movie where you go to a hidden scientific base and it looks like it was thrown together with duct tape and zip ties and they just give you a bunch of scientific mumbo jumbo about the new the next stage of humanity and then there's a lot of weirdness that happens. And when when he gets when he comes out as a caveman, that was a disappointment to me. That was not that was not a, a pleasant surprise. But uh, there were for all the things in it that I didn't necessarily like, there were a lot of things that hit the like. Uh, the stuff I like, and I just thought felt that it, I like the kind of mix of kind of mod science fiction made out of 70s stuff and also just every now and then seeing a real rundown train station, you know, just kind of like a crappy train station. So it, I, wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but I would say the part of me that genuinely likes Zardoz, I think also genuinely likes this movie a little bit. Also, too, like sometimes we think about the best, like Matt and I will think about the best context for a movie. And this movie would be really cool if you had it running like during a party. Yes. Yeah. Like that would win. You would win if you had it running, if there was no expectation, like mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. And and people say that about the new cats movie too, that it would actually be fantastic if it's just playing on the TV during a party. Mm, I would say cats rewards a close viewing <laughs> uh, in hilarity. But I think if the way that you guys first watch the movie, I think is the right way to watch it where you're just skipping around in the movie yeah. because it doesn't the scenes don't really matter and you just see a bunch of neat stuff and hopefully yeah. you'll get some science mumbo jumbo in there um and uh it but it, the movie did make me feel good about my decision to not throw myself into the oeuvre of michael moorcock and get lost in his dozens of novels about mm -hmm. the same hero reverberating throughout history Stu, well rebuttal? we'll talk about that we'll talk about that another time elliot i don't think this is the the place <laughs> i want matt to have a shot at going back at his at his remark you can use the same one which is the <laughs> no what i line what from I, mystery science theater you what can I use would, that no what i'd like to do is personally apologize to the mst3k fan base who are a lovely group of people please don't uh let my ignorance inhibit you from donating to our make more mst3k <laughs> sure. kickstarter campaign that's right i guys. promise let's, i'll let's be hear, less ignorant in the future let's hear about this kickstarter campaign let's hear again where can we find this kickstarter campaign and how can we contribute to it and what can we get from it joel make more mst3k.com it's on kickstarter uh, we're making new shows. It's like the one we did six years ago. It's it's new shows 
and its own online theater called the Gizmoplex and lots of um, um, amazing rewards. And we're working with our, our, our Kickstarter guru, Ivan Asquith, who's brilliant and uh, we're happy to be working with them again. Yeah. I know I'm going to be contributing, and if you're like me, and I know I am, do as I do now and that's contribute. From, that's two. That's two MST lines back to there back. There you go. Okay, so those are two classics. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> to be really strict, it was I think also the Fire Sign Theater. If you're yeah, like yeah, that me, too. I know I am right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so We're I'm so stealing from fun. Mystery Science Theater, stealing from Fire Sign Theater. No, we've taken so much, you guys. <laughs> there was, there was, there was. And we're going to take more. I feel like this is that this has been my life experience with Mr. Science Theater is is the thinking something is funny and not knowing why and then hearing the original and there's a there's one episode Joel where you're just like you know everyone knows funds where the fair's at and I was like what is what and then eventually hearing was it we're all bozos on this bus and being like oh okay that's what that's from so if you want more of that rich tapestry of jokes pokes riffs and gifts then mm -hmm. just go to <laughs> what is it bring back mst3k.com Make, make more. Make more oh, make more. I'm sorry. I apologize. Don't listen to me. Make more mst3k.com. Thanks, you guys. Hey, it's so it much is. fun being here. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for coming Thank on. Thank you. Yay. This has been great. Pleasure. We're so glad to have you on. Hey, kid. Your dad tell you about the time he broke Stephen Dorff's nose at the Kids' Choice Awards? <laughs> In Dead Pilot Society, scripts that were developed by studios and networks but were never produced are given the table reads they deserve. When I was a kid, I had to spend my Christmas break filming a PSA about angel dust. So yeah, being a kid sucks sometimes. Presented by Andrew Reich and Ben Blacker. Dead Pilot Society, twice a month on MaximumFun.org. You know, the show you like, that hobo with the scarf who lives in a magic dumpster. <laughs> Doctor Who. Yeah. Hey, Jay Keith. Hey, Helen. Hey, you've got another true false quiz for me? Yep. Our trivia podcast, Go Fact Yourself, used to be in front of a live audience. True. Turns out that's not so safe anymore. Correct. Next. Unfortunately, this means we can no longer record the show. False. The show still comes out every first and third Friday of the month. Correct. Finally, we still have great celebrity guests answering trivia about things they love on every episode of Go Fact Yourself. Definitely true. And for bonus points, name some of them. Recently, we've had uh, Ophira Eisenberg, plus tons of surprise experts like Yardley Smith and Suzanne Summers. Perfect score. Woohoo! You can hear Go Fact Yourself every first and third Friday of the month with all the great guests and trivia that we've always had. And if you don't listen, well, then you can Go Fact Yourself. That's the name of our podcast. Correct. Woohoo! The Flophouse is sponsored in part by Storyblocks. Yeah, it is. Now more than ever, storytellers and content creators are challenged with producing more video content at a higher quality than ever before. Keep up with the growing demands for modern video content without sacrificing your vision with stock media from Storyblocks. Storyblocks is dedicated to being the world's best royalty-free stock media subscription service with an ever-growing library that has over 1 million high-quality stock assets, including 4K slash HD footage, After Effects, and Premiere Pro templates, music, images, sound effects, and more. They have affordable subscription plans and tools, and with Storyblocks' unlimited all-access plan, you can get unlimited downloads of everything in their library. And even if your subscription ends, everything you've downloaded is yours to keep. You know... If you make video stuff, sometimes you just need some stock footage of, I don't know, a guy crossing the street or something mm -hmm. that you don't, you know, like you don't want to steal something. You don't want to get something uncopyrighted. You're putting this out in the world. Mm -hmm. This is your uh, creation. You want to buy stock footage. Uh, Alex mentioned before, for the last live Flophouse show on Zoom, I made a video uh, about uh, where I sang a song about how I had to pee and we're having intermission because I got to pee. And uh, I got to tell you... Great, high quality, high def images of things like a clown dancing that I put in the background. Um, but anyway, so if you want to explore their library and subscribe today, you can go to storyblocks.com slash flop. That's storyblocks.com slash flop. Hey, Dan. Uh, you know, the Flophouse is also supported in part by Libby. I got to tell you guys a little story. Uh, so uh -huh. this is a true story from my life. I'm recording okay. this right now from my in-law's house in Northern California. Two days ago, 
my family, we're driving up here in our car. It's a mm -hmm. six-hour drive on a good day. And what happened this most recent time? Traffic. Bad traffic. Mm. Suddenly, oh, we're no. crawling through downtown Walnut Creek. No thank you. Normally, in this situation, my kids would be- You should have stayed in the car instead of crawling. That's, That's true. That's problem That's there. a good point. Anyway, normally- and you I'll probably listen with... to all the uh, the talk radio you can normally listen to, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to continue with the ad now. We, we'd only listen- okay. We'd already listened to the Moana soundtrack probably 17 times. Normally, in that situation, my kids would be throwing a full-on rebellion. But not this time. Why? One word. Libby. Libby is a free reading app created by Overdrive that lets you borrow ebooks and audiobooks from your library on your phone, tablets, Kindles, computer. If it's electronic, you can borrow things on it with Libby. All you need is a valid library card from your library. And even if you don't have a library card currently, you can read samples of any book you see. It works just like your physical library. With Libby, you can borrow available books you want to read, and they return themselves automatically after your loan expires. I wish my physical library worked that way. Uh, my fines would not be so high. So we're driving up north, and each time the kids are getting restless, we just hit the Libby. Bam! House on Pooh Corner. Boom! Marvelous Land of Oz. Kapow! Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Also, they have picture books, even. Probably all kinds of grown-up books. I don't know. I don't get to listen to grown-up books anymore. It's two. It's a great ebook and audiobook service, and you don't feel the guilt that comes with patronizing, let's say, a huge corporation that treats its warehouse workers like dirt, because it's all through your local library. So download Libby in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store to start borrowing and sampling ebooks and audiobooks today. I recommend it. Yay. Boom. Stuart. And you know what you know what that sound is? That's an incoming j -j 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 Jumbotron. Boom, boom, boom. I like that last ja that came a little bit after the other ones. <laughs> yep. Uh, mm -hmm. This message is for Tom. This message is from Sarah. This April, Tom and I celebrate our fifth wedding anniversary. Since we can't travel, I wanted to ask the Peaches to give my sweetheart a shout out. Tom, you're the bee's knees, my snickerdoodle, and I can't imagine being stuck at home with anyone else. Also, from our house cat to yours, Rarow. Or Bow Ma Mao. <laughs> that was a sweet message. Thank you. Yeah. That was very sweet. And uh, you're named after uh, uh, one of the best cookies. That's Tom? A... No, no. The, the Snickerdoodle, the pet name. Uh, the pet okay. name. <laughs> no, Tom's are pretty I'm good a... too. Tom's of Maine cookies. It's made out of beeswax or something. <laughs> oh, yummy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you wait, any plugs those, before we move along? Were those Tom of Finland cookies? Hold on a mm. second. Oh, Check boy. it out. Just just Google that. <laughs> just Google mm -hmm. it right now. Uh, I'll, before you do that, I have one thing I'd like to plug. Uh, my comic book, Maniac of New York. New issues are still coming out. Issue 3 comes out April 14th. It'll be in comic stores. And if you can't make it to your local store, they're sold out. Uh, you can also get it on Comixology. But as always, support your local comic book store. Yeah, and if you're uh, running away from the maniac in New York, mm -hmm. why don't you uh, come to Hinterlands Bar or Minis Bar and say hi and buy some stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so let's move on uh -huh. to letters from listeners. Like you. Like you. Uh, I got a couple of letters here, and I can't remember whether I pulled them up on my phone or on it. So the it looks computer. like it's time for a song, because we got oh, a couple boy. of letters, and it might be long till Dan pulls them up on his device. Wouldn't it be nice if he did it ahead of time? But hey, I'm sure he's a busy guy doing stuff like <laughs> watching TV and reading old comics, thinking about <laughs> things nobody cares about. That's right, Dan's. A busy guy once he missed part of a movie because he was cutting a mango up he could have paused it but he didn't he's a busy guy he doesn't have time for all of that stuff no dan so busy he doesn't have time for what you might call the very basics of producing a podcast that he's been doing for almost a decade and a half Jeez. that's right he's dan he's a busy guy he's a busy guy he's a busy 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 busy, busy. Busy guy, busy guy, starring Dan McCoy as himself, created by Chuck okay. Lorre. Thank you. I I did have it pulled up. I just couldn't remember whether it was on my phone or my computer, and then I chose the wrong one. But anyway, sometimes Dan has two screens <laughs> open. It's a second yep. screen experience, <laughs> and God. Dan doesn't know what screen to look at. This modern world's mm -hmm. so full of screens. Everybody knows what I mean. Hey guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Does this look green? <laughs> I'm pointing to okay. a toe that I stubbed the other day. Hey, Dan's got too many screens. Dan's got too many screens is brought to you by Rolled Gold Pretzels. Uh, wow. All right, thanks. That's a big one. Uh, so, all right, here's the first letter. It's from Marissa, last name withheld. So what screen were they right. on, just so that our audience gets closure? What? Uh, it, it was on my phone, but then once I was using my laptop, I decided to go with it. Greetings, peaches. Any longtime Flophouse devotee knows that the show's deep C-plot is the discussion and celebration of newspaper comic strips and their characters and lore. Mm, yeah. Re- we, did, sir, recently, we did plenty of that already in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> recently, thanks to the Flophouse Facebook group, I was introduced to the current Farsight-esque single-panel iteration of Heathcliff. Example, on the day I'm writing this email, today is Heathcliff... Features the eponymous cat standing in the living room, hands folded behind his back, facing a birdcage. The bird appears to be speaking to Heathcliff. The caption shows up shows us what the bird is saying. I have friends who are bees. My burning desire to know what the Flophouse fellas think about this bizarre, mm-hmm. racy new Heathcliff gave me an idea. A spin-off podcast, perhaps a series of minis, perhaps an iPodius style donors only only bonus miniseries where the three of you unleash all of your comic strip thoughts, feelings, and arcane knowledge into the world. What strips do you think would provide the most fodder for such a series? What are your thoughts on Peter Gallagher's Heathcliff? Remember to save some of the good stuff for the spinoff podcast. Okay. Love and thanks for everything. Marissa, last name withheld. I will say about Heathcliff specifically. Just make sure you don't give up too much. you got to keep some behind the paywall. Yeah. When, <laughs> put it on your premium, kid, dude. When I was a kid, uh, I don't know whether like this version of Heathcliff was always like this. Like when I was a kid, I remember Heathcliff, and I was like, "Oh, this is like off-brand Garfield. I'm not interested in this." You know, I'm a kid. I like uh, really obvious things, like a cat that talks about how he likes food and hates Mondays. Mm-hmm. But now that I'm an adult, I don't know whether the surrealist Heathcliff is new or it's always been the case. But I. I get a kick out of it. I don't understand it, uh, but that's the joy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If I was going to do a Flophouse-style one, one of the most inexplic- inexplicable ones to me is Fred Bassett, which I don't think I've ever mm. detected a joke in. Oh, no. Fred Bassett is just about a depressed dog. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be uh, a, a good one, I think. Uh, Stuart, or would you just talk about how attractive you find the mom in Rose's Rose? I find her very uh, attractive, Dan. She knows it. I send her letters all the fucking time. The mom, the it's mom become who, a problem. I mean, the mom in, the mom in Rose's Rose if, is, if resembles your actual wife in a number of ways, from uh-huh. her tough attitude to yep. her to mm. her red hair. Yeah, uh-huh. curly red hair. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I feel like. I feel like it might be helpful to, to for a show, you know, to sustain, a, you know, a show. We might want to pick something with a really deep narrative. So I don't know, like uh, like the Slylock Fox, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, or like Funky Winkerbean. We talk about Funky we- Winkerbean a lot on this show. That's because you know we love it. Dan, it's Dan's favorite comic strip. Uh, I feel like I feel like Funky Winker Bean is famously on the internet, at least the comic that ha- gets the most of that type of flop style coverage because yeah. it is so inexplicably sad. Yeah, uh, when it's mostly meant to just do jokes about band teachers, you know. Uh-huh. But uh, I think I want to mention first off, who am I attracted to on the comics page? The mom in the family circle, but after the haircut, you know the one I'm talking about. When they cut their hair to make it, she cut her hair to make it a little more modern. Uh, I think. My thoughts on Heathcliff in, are... In f- you said family circle. Is that the same thing as family circus? Oh, sorry. Am I meant I... family circus. Family circle okay. is a magazine, which is, I'm also sure of is full of hot moms, but I, <laughs> I haven't looked at it too much. Uh, the, uh, the thing about Heathcliff I wanted to mention is that when I was a kid, I would actually skip the main comic strip and just read the last panel where readers would send in their stories about how weird their cats were at home. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was more entertaining to me than the actual comic strip. But... Uh, this this just goes to speak about how like there are a lot of comics that last for a long time on inertia and so I think maybe I would cover Mama the comic strip about uh, a mom and her oh, son yeah. and there's no jokes in it and it's not a pleasant to look at strip and it's I've as even as a kid I was like why is this here like why is this in here I don't understand this uh, either that or um or that Prince Valiant strip where there's there's almost no 
there's no dialogue balloons. It's mm-hmm. just it's just illustrated pictures. And as a kid, I could not. I it was it was something that I was so baffled by. I wouldn't I wasn't understand what I was supposed to get out of it. Yeah, like Mark Trail or something. Um, I feel Mark like Trail had great nature tips. I feel like I would. I feel like we should do it uh, based on that comic strip, Caroline in the City. Uh, well, that's actually not a real strip, Stuart. That's, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> wait yeah, a minute. That's, but um... she made the strips on the show, so like, would they just throw them in the fucking trash? <laughs> I, like, yes, what a they waste. did. They didn't want it, and they publish them. That would have been um, a great amount of like that yeah, would be tie-in. perfect synergy. Yeah, tie-in. Yeah, well, what you're really yeah, what you're learning is that you could have hung out outside of her apartment and just picked up the old strips from the garbage, and you'd have priceless. Priceless pieces of art. Wait, they shot incident. that in like her Leah apartment? Thompson? Yeah, they shot it in <laughs> in her Leah Thompson's actual apartment that she bought with her Howard the Duck royalties. Uh, and it's mm. just, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, we should, well, we should get in touch with her and just ask her what she did with all that original Wait, so she, she bought, bought the herself. apartment with her royalties. So she, if she bought the apartment with her royalties, she then decided to, what, subsidize the mortgage on the apartment by shooting it there so she could charge the production yes. extra money. Yeah, exactly. that makes sense. Oh, man. That's, yeah, it's, that's how they get you. Double dipping, it's, you know. It's overhead. They, they, they say it's overhead and they pay themselves, you know. Yeah. Also, she yeah. stole all her clothes from that show and also the theme song. And I don't even know what you're going to do with that theme song, but she just walked away with it one day and she just keeps it at her house, yeah. which is that apartment. No, yeah, I mean, it'd be weird to walk off set if you're just walking back into your own apartment, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that's fair. Yeah, that's I guess, yeah, but really the hard, I guess you just stopped them from taking the things out of her apartment. Yeah, that's actually true. true. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the second and final letter of this uh, particular episode. Dan, before we do goes... that, I have two what? I have two other songs oh. about the two screen uh, problem before. I have two parody okay, songs. Okay. I'll do one uh-huh. now and one after this uh-huh. letter. So this first okay. one, of course, you'll remember what the source of it is. Whatever happened to the letters from the listeners? I thought they were on my laptop, but maybe they're on my phone. <laughs> ah, everywhere you look, everywhere there's a letter. Or maybe it's on another screen now. Anyway, so that was the first okay, one. I'll have yeah, another yeah, one after I'm this letter. I interrupted Dan for that one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I mean, I'm always glad I interrupted Dan. I get a little endorphin boost each time. Yeah, that explains it. Uh, this is from James, last name withheld. Who James writes? James L. Brooks? It's James L. Brooks. His, his, name's is, his name is James A.T.G. Peach. Uh, after hearing the recommendation for Stewart's performance as Tube Man in Psycho Gorman, uh-huh. I went looking for <laughs> his IMDb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, Gorman? I, I, like, I don't no, know. Gorman. Uh, <laughs> I recognized the title Snatchers from the pod, but was surprised by another title I don't recall ever hearing discussed. That is the 2005 movie The Wiggles Sailing Around the World. Uh This film features Stuart Wellington in the role of friendly pirate crew. Is there a reason this hasn't made it to recommendations before? And should I expect the usual level of gore from this as I do in all Wellington vehicles? Uh Keep flopping me mateys, James last name withheld. You know, I've been been asked, this this has come up a lot. Uh, I get asked this a lot on social media, at the bar, on the street at the grocery store mm-hmm. and uh the 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 short answer is if i made this movie i do not remember it so i <laughs> <laughs> i mean 2000 what was that 2005 that uh, was a that- kind of weird time to be a steward okay <laughs> mm-hmm. so i i can't a steward a, a steward or- yeah yeah me Stuart yeah. pankin that's it. I don't know any other stewards. <laughs> it was a weird time to be Stuart Pankin. Be like, do I have a career anymore? I don't know. Where am I? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, long story short, I don't think it's me. Uh, you might want to watch it. And if it's me, send me. A, you can tweet at me. You can send Dan an email at uh, Dan at Gmail or whatever. I don't remember what it is, his email is. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking to. Sorry, I'm distracted because I'm looking to see what Stuart Pankin was doing in 2005. This is this is important. This is important stuff. Uh, look, uh, he was on two episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Okay. That makes sense. Which I guess started in 2005 or no? This is in 2005. He was in Great. these episodes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so Stuart, uh, so you're saying that you don't have any hilarious behind the scenes anecdotes about your time with the Wiggles? I don't. I mean, again, I. Don't, there might be some out there. There might be accounts out there, but I don't remember them at this point. So who knows? Maybe yeah, I if I get just... maybe if I get hit on the head with another coconut, I'll remember <laughs> them. 
that's how it works. Only Remember, if you, get hit, if you get hit too many times, you'll lose all your memory forever. I got that from an episode of Ch- uh, Charles in Charge. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 So Stuart Pankin seems to have uh, 161 credits. Yeah. Um, some of them, you know, they're just this year. So he's doing okay. Yeah. You know, if you thought that after not necessarily the news and uh, nearly departed, mm-hmm. uh, that was the end of Stuart Pankin. I mean, the yeah. fact is you are... Stuart Pankin's acting is just a side hustle. He got rich off of Panko, which is what he invented. <laughs> wow. And wow, he's just been living pretty. Yeah. 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 I mean, they are the superior breadcrumb for frying. So, so thank you, Stuart uh, Pankin, for yeah. toiling yeah, away let's... in your in your garage lab uh-huh. uh, to get us the exact best crumbs for for frying it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was great. So now we're gonna do. <laughs> so now, wait, wait, I've got my last song. Oh, okay. Okay, this goes do up, doop a doo way, do uh-huh. up. Doop a doo a. Which oh, yeah. of Dan Screens has the letters questions on it? Okay, that's the last one. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rockapella, for stopping by. Um, Rockapella. This... That's when I do an impression of Rockapella. <laughs> uh, the thing that we do now is we recommend movies, movies that might uh, be more immediately um, rewarding than the final program. Uh I haven't seen a lot recently, but I did watch uh, the SpongeBob SquarePants movie from 2004. <laughs> 2004's uh, SpongeBob movie. You finally caught up with it, huh? A trim 87 minutes. <laughs> Love that shit. And, uh, um, you know, I I didn't I didn't grow up with SpongeBob. Uh, <laughs> I love that uh, every, every comment you have now is secondary to the runtime, which was your main selling point. <laughs> but you're saying Audrey, did she grow up with it? Uh, yeah, she's she's a, uh, like nine years younger than me. She's not like uh, hugely younger, but she's definitely of a different enough generation that she grew up with SpongeBob. And, so like a um, December-May romance or December- Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. he's not robbing the cradle. Well, he's I- just robbing the middle school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, let's not uh, belabor this part of it too much but she has introduced me to spongebob okay. um as a pleasant funny thing to watch uh toss on the television and uh a lot of great jokes i like that uh the the spongebob has sort of continued the older style of cartooning where or, or car- cartoons where i feel like post simpsons like and post you know reduced cell animation things got really like um tight and uh not as expressive like there's a lot of silly stuff on the simpsons but even so they stay on model a lot whereas like a show like spongebob is like we're gonna push the character design in crazy directions we don't care we don't care if this is on model like we're gonna have a scene where spongebob and patrick slowly uh you know dehydrate and it's uh crazy how uh weird they look and uh i just like that it has that zany quality that i think got lost somewhere along the way with some cartoons and i i found it very so dan if you had to cast spongebob squarepants using only the members of the flop house who would play whom okay well i am squidward okay Obviously, I'm glad. Okay. I'm glad you didn't make uh, us point that out. Thank you. I think that Elliot probably is SpongeBob, yep, Bob, although he's yeah. a little more like deliberately irritating uh-huh. than SpongeBob. SpongeBob mm. only annoys through like the goodness of his heart, whereas Elliot's more of a little stinker. <laughs> um, and I guess you are Mr. Krabs. Oh, a Stuart, Stuart would be that. That who's that? That uh, that starfish who's always hanging out with. With SpongeBob. Oh, Patrick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. LA, Patrick. LA the beach got shorts. it right. Yeah. 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 LA yeah. Got, that's the right okay. answer, Dan. You did it. Uh, if Patrick what do you want had, your prize? If Patrick had Mr. Krabs' <laughs> job. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you guys got? Well, I was going to recommend 2004's SpongeBob movie, but I guess they. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of you on look everybody's like an lips. Asshole, right? You don't know, <laughs> like an do you think that was. Guys, a uh, serious question. Do you think that was the biggest zag in terms of a recommendation on the Flop House, or has there been a bigger one? I don't. I think that's one to open up to the fans. Fans, do you remember yeah. a bigger zag than that one? <laughs> zag, a technical term meaning surprising <laughs> recommendation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, let's see. I'll recommend, since we're recommend, uh, recommending shorties today, right? It's all about shorties. Uh, Do you mean kids movies or short movies? Short movies. Oh, okay. Although you could watch this with a kid if the kid is pretty grown up and has a refined sense of uh, taste. That's right. I'm recommending another Shutter movie. That's a movie you could see on Shutter. It's a movie called Slacks. That's because it's about mm. a pair of killer jeans, and not just because they look good. It's because they kill people. Now it's like, and that's with two X's. Two the slacks, X's. The spelling. Yep. Uh, and it is, and I'm not just recommending this, uh, another Shutter movie because they sent me a gift basket full of Shutter treats. Uh, I appreciate that they respect that I am a cool influencer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Slacks is, I mean, it's a movie about a killer pair of jeans set in like a, like an old Navy style. I don't know. Is that, is that a big box store? Is that a small box store? I don't know. It's a medium um, sized box size store. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, it's box. medium sized box. So it, I mean, you, uh, and it plays the container with like, store. I guess would be like all those sizes of boxes yes, in one store. Everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The yeah. so it you know it plays with some pretty uh, pretty straightforward satire on like retail culture and hipster culture and that stuff that stuff we've kind of seen a million times before. But it um, the performances are all pretty fun. The uh, and it's it's super colorful. Maybe I was just excited after watching Justice League to see a movie that has a ton of colors in it. Um, and it's uh, it's shot really well and it's fun to watch. Uh, and it's super short, so. Salax. Uh and I'm going to recommend a movie that I guess I mean I don't really remember the runtime. It didn't strike me as being super I'm gonna, long. I'm going to so check guess, it out real quick. So okay, I'll just pull so up IMDb and Okay, see so if this I'm going to this movie is recommendation is in honor see of if I uh, the late bust your biscuits on this one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, make sure I'll get my biscuits ready for a possible busting. Uh and they're ready. Okay, so this one, it's a uh, recommendation in honor of the late Joan Micklin Silver, who passed away at the end of last year. Uh, you may remember her from Crossing the Lancy or Hester Street, uh, which is one of my, one of my favorite uh, Carol Kane performances. Anyway, I watched a movie of hers I hadn't seen before. It's called Between the Lines, and it's a kind of ensemble comedy drama from the 70s about a countercultural newspaper that is outgrowing its uh, – its position as a counterculture newspaper, basically, and how that affects the people who work at the paper. It's very 70s, but in a different way than the final program is very 70s. Hour uh, some... 41, Elliot. Ooh, hour 41. So you're going to want to watch this in three parts. Uh, yeah. so, uh, but the well, movie's what you got to also... do is you got to mess up. You got to mess up a ton of dishes, like order some kind of mm-hmm. meal that comes with like all <laughs> kinds of sauces and shit. So you you're just gonna, fuck it all up so you'll have extra time to watch your movie. You're going to want to keep burning the rice so you got multiple pots to, to <laughs> yeah. scour out yeah. so you can have enough time to watch it. Uh, it's also in a lot of ways relevant to this modern world of kind of scrappy startups selling out to big tech corporations and what that means for people. Uh, I feel like it goes one-to-one in some way. And it's got a great cast. It's got Lindsey Krauss, Gwen Wells, John Hurd, Bruno Kirby, Michael J. Pollard, and jo- and Jeff Goldblum is, a set, is especially great in it as this kind of like – He's this rock critic who's kind of like if Kramer from Seinfeld was like a young, cool guy. Uh, and this is – just going to say it. Top drawer, young, sexy Jeff Goldblum. Like oh, he's, no. You're going you're gonna to want it. So anyway, uh, it's called Between the Lines. Uh, it's funny and serious, and it's on Canopy right now, I believe. So if you, uh, like me, enjoy Joan Micklin Silver stuff and you haven't seen it, try Between the Lines. Not Between the Lions, which is a PBS show about yeah. reading. Uh, starring the lions from the public library in New York. This is between Wait, the lions. Are they characters? Are they characters on that show? They are characters. They are puppets on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So of patience uh, that was and fortitude, a, the two lions. Thanks yeah. for proving you know the names. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> we got <laughs> that was two shorties in a medium style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, great. I guess that makes one big. Uh, yep movie burger uh-huh. that you can eat mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yep just to get a shorty stick a meaty inside there get another shorty and that's Ow. your yeah. movie witch yeah sorry muscles is biting me now uh he's saying this well, episode sucks Stuart. stop it if if the if people didn't know that your cat's name is muscles then the grammar of that sentence would really baffle them <laughs> okay well uh, we don't want to anger muscles further, lest he consume. <laughs> he's, he's going crazy. <laughs> oh, he is. He is actually going crazy. Let me get a screenshot of that, so maybe I can uh, 
uh, sit it out with a. Oh, uh, he's such he, a show goes. He's crazy. saying, Boy. "I'm the star of the show now. Put me on the air. <laughs> I'm the mama." Anyway, uh, <laughs> let us uh, say goodbye uh, for one another episode. Thank you so much to our guests, Joel and Matt, for it's, being it's here. Great. A dream. What a what a what a treat! Uh, thank you to Jordan Cowling for producing the show. Thank you to Maximum Fun. Go over to maximumfun.org for other great podcasts on this great podcasting network. Uh, and if you have the chance, let people know about the show, tweet about it, review it on iTunes. But for now, I have been Dan McCoy. I am Stuart Wellington. My name's Elliot. Kaylin, I don't know why we're all talking a little bit like the movie phone guy, but uh-huh. not exactly like the movie phone guy, but okay, I'll run with it. This has been The Flophouse, rated R. Goodbye. <laughs> For this? For this? Maximumfun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.